Good afternoon. Today is July 16, 2005. We are at the home of John Casares in Haverhill, Massachusetts. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Haverhill Veterans Oral History Project. Welcome, John. Welcome to you and welcome to my home. Thank you. Thank you for uh, taking the time for this interview today. Uh, let's start out, John. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you were born, your date of birth. I was born here in Haverhill, Massachusetts, uh, July 6, 1923. I'm 82 years old today, uh, and I was just about 10 days ago. Uh, my father and mother were born in Patras, Greece, which is the third largest city in Greece. And, uh, and my father arrived here around 1898, and my mother came shortly thereafter. She was situated in Peabody, Mass, and my father came to Haverhill directly. Um, they eventually got together and knowing each other from Patras, they eventually got married and had uh, six children. Uh, a brother named Sardis, who was the principal at Haverhill High School, he was the oldest. And then next in line was my brother George, who was the mayor of Haverhill. And uh, then I had two sisters, uh, my sister Anne, who was a vice president of General Motors, and my sister Madeline, who uh, was situated in uh, Springfield and still lives there. My uh, younger brother, Chuck, uh, uh, was also born. We were all born in Haverhill, and the four brothers all uh, entered into the service. Three of us uh, were in the Air Force, and my brother George was the only one in the Army. You were, you were fifth of six children? I was uh, the, the, the fifth of six children, and uh, the, my brother George and my brother Cyrus are both deceased. Uh, my sister Anne is deceased, and uh, there's three of us living. My, br uh, my sister Madeline, who lives in Springfield. My brother Chuck lives in uh, Furstenfeld, Austria, six months of the year, six months in Florida, and myself. I'll be done. Tell us a little bit about what you were doing prior to entering the service. Well, prior to going to the service, I was a, I was a senior in Haverhill High School, and also my brother George and I ran a grocery store on Emerson Street, and uh, we call it the Casares Brothers uh, Grocery Store. And uh, we wanted to know exactly when Pearl Harbor took effect. I happened to be working as Sunday, and uh, it was my turn to work. And my brother George was home with all my other siblings and my mother and father. And I'm, I was listening to the radio, and uh, I was astounded to hear that uh, uh, Pearl Harbor was being attacked. But prior to that, we had, uh, two magazines we would get at the store, and one was the Life magazine with a lot of pictures, and another one was Collier's magazine. And I loved both magazines. The, uh, one of the magazines, the Life magazine especially, had a picture on the front page, and it said uh, the caption on it was Impregnable Pearl Harbor. And it showed Battleship Row in Pearl Harbor well before the invasion took place. I had a not invasion, but the attack. Collier also had an article similar to that, but not as many, not pictures. Uh, I was astounded to see that they, they would print something like that, knowing that the war was about to begin and that the, uh, the Japanese were certainly going to fight us. Uh, well, what happened is that uh, after the war, I tried to find both magazines. And I can't find this Life magazine, but I did find the Collier magazine in the Boston Public Library, and I got a copy of it. And it's very astounding to read. And one of these days, if you'd like to see it, I'd be happy to show it to you. So, what, what, uh, listening to the radio, what were your thoughts when you heard uh, about the invasion? Well, you were I, obviously very familiar with Pearl Harbor, where I think a lot of Americans probably weren't. Uh, is that well, true? The only reason we were familiar about it was the fact that uh, our Navy was there and, and, and the strength of the Navy was uh, in the Pacific was there in Pearl Harbor. Uh, the fortunate part was that uh, when the attack took place, uh, we had a lot of old ships there, but uh, the Arizona and a couple others were newer ships that we lost with a, with a lot of personnel. Uh, it was a very uh, shocking to us. Uh, luckily, that our three uh, aircraft carriers were out to sea, and uh, they weren't touched. Uh, the very next day, uh, we went back to Cross Haverhill High School, and our principal at that time was a Mr. McLeod, 
and uh, he had us go into the assembly uh, hall and listen to President Roosevelt's uh, speech about the Day of Epiphany. And uh, all the freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors were in the assembly hall and they heard that speech. And, uh, okay then, so you finished out your senior year, or when did you enlist then into the, into the uh, service? Several of us went right down to Naval uh, uh, Recruit Station, and uh, it was within a, a few days after Pearl Harbor, or I think it was probably around the second or third of January, and we uh, applied for the uh, Naval Air Cadet Program. We all wanted to be pilots, and I was very interested in flying. Uh, friends of mine uh, named Eddie Salas and I uh, used to make uh, model airplanes together, and uh, he came along with me and we uh, applied for the Air, Naval Air Cadet Program. We took the examination at the uh, Naval uh, Post Office, and we passed that examination, a mental. Then we took a physical, and we passed that. They told us we'd have to wait a while, and, and we'd have to go to Boston to uh, and get re-examined and uh, re physical which we did uh, shortly thereafter. We took the, the physical pass out, took the mental pass out, it was a couple of days over there. And then they told us to go home and they'll call us up because there was a surplus of uh, uh, people trying to join the Naval Academy program. So we waited our turn. In the meantime, I, I thought I'd go to work at the Portsmouth Navy Yard and while I was going to high school, I worked at the Portsmouth Navy Yard and I turned the store over to my brother George. And uh, the reason I went up there is uh, uh, we were working on submarines and, and I'll never forget the fact that the, the squalers, which had sunk off the Portsmouth coast, was uh, brought back to surface by the bell and they saved to some 27 people, I think. And uh, we were working on that and I was uh, working on a crane helping load the new sailfish, that's what they named that squalus. So it was quite interesting in, in my work up there. And incidentally, the sailfish, which was the original squalus, went out to the Pacific. And can you imagine sailors uh, being in that uh, submarine? I wouldn't want to do it. But they went out in the Pacific, no one came, not one of them came back with a scratch. And they did, a, they, they did an animal job there. Well, what happened is that uh, Shortly uh, thereafter, probably a month or so went by, and we were recalled to go back to Boston. And we went down to Causeway Street in Boston where the Naval Headquarters was. And again, we were re-examined. And we were ready to, uh, we all passed, there were about 10 of us at the time. And we were about to uh, get on a bus and, and head somewhere, probably down in Florida for our training. And uh, somebody came up, uh, who was an officer and said, wait a minute, before you people leave, we got one more test to give you. So we went back in for that test and it happened to be a Japanese test. And they had little dots, of colored dots in a, in a chart. And they told us to read the numbers. Well, I couldn't see numbers. Seven out of 10 of us couldn't read the numbers. So the officer said, well, we can't have you in the Navy. You can't have you flying if you, if you can't see those dots. You have a color perception problem. So you're relieved to go home. But by this time, we had been sworn in twice in the Navy, once in Havel, once in Boston. So we said, hey, wait a minute. We, we're in the Navy. We've been sworn in the Navy. No, no, you, you're not in the Navy. We, we don't want you. Uh, you have a problem with your, your eyes. You have a color perception problem. In the Navy, you know, you have to know your colors. So they sent us home. Well, we have never received a discharge from the Navy, so that's that's the fun part of when we discuss things in the, with, with this group that uh, uh, a couple of us are still around. And I'm wondering if we if we ever going to get any back pay. <laughs> well, we were kind of discussing with the Navy when they did that, so we said, well, we'll give up the Navy, but we'll join the Air Force. So we came back to Havel, and we all uh, applied for the Air Force training. Which at that time was still the Army Air Corps, is that Sorry. correct? At that time was still the Army Air Corps. It was the Army Corps. Air Corps, yeah. yeah. It wasn't until the Air Force until well after, a couple of years after the war. What happened is that uh, <clears throat> the time had passed and there were so many uh, applicants for the Na Naval and Air Cadet program as far as the Army uh, Air Corps was concerned. 
So they kept pushing us backwards. Finally, they did take us into the Air Force. We took more tests down, down at uh, Devons. There was 20 of us, seven of us, finally entered the Air Force on the, the, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1942. So we waited that long to get in. They needed, they needed men, but we waited that long to get in. Well, the, the, the sad, sad story was that we were all sworn into the Army uh, Air Corps. But when we got to Devons, if you couldn't pass the Air Force test, they put you in the Army. But fortunately, my brother saw it, who had already uh, gone through the procedure, and he was uh, going to Austin's training school down in Miami. He gave me some background knowledge as to what the test was going to be about, and I passed, and, and uh, the next thing we knew, we were heading for Miami Beach. Did that's where our basic training was. Uh, do you remember the day you left Haverhill uh, uh, no, to head for, for basic training? Your was, family would see you off and such? It was, it was probably the 8th or 9th of uh, December. And uh, it took us about two or three days to go by train to Miami. We arrived in Miami. My brother was stationed in basic training center, center number one. And he was right in Miami Beach. And we were north of Miami Beach, which is basic training center number nine. And there was probably 100,000 airmen in each one of the basic training centers. They also had another one in Atlantic City. But we just happened to be fortunate to get down to Miami during the middle of winter. So we went through basic training, and, and uh, my brother was going through well, officer training school, which he did go through. And uh, what they did with me, they, they made a, an aerial gunner out of me instead of a pilot. Because by this time, they had so many pilots. Uh, they didn't need us, so uh, they sent us down to Fort Myers, Florida for gunnery training purposes. And uh, that's where we get our gunnery training program. Uh, 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 we were instituted into, into gunnery there. Now, at this point, had you uh, or any of you, your Haverhill buddies, still with you, or were you solo at this point? By this time, they split us all up. I had a fellow by the name of Alan Noyce who was with me, and uh, he, he was, they went in the Navy, but he ended up in public relations. Eventually, he became a general, but I'll tell you a story about that a little later on. Uh, the other one uh, was a fellow named Sullivan. I can't remember his first name. Uh, he still lives in Havel. These two fellows are still alive. And he, he went to another section. I don't know where he went. And there's another fellow named Joseph Pazarito, who was a good friend of mine. He is uh, still living, but uh, they, they sent him up to uh, Boca Raton, Flo uh, Florida. At that time, uh, nobody wanted to go to Boca Raton because it was, uh, uh, it, was, it was like the Pacific. People were getting yellow jaundice up there, and they were sleeping in tents. It's not the way it is today. Today it's a very exclusive city. Well, I'll tell you a story about my friend Alan Noyce. Uh, Alan Noyce and, uh, and Azrito and I, we all went through school together. We came, went in the Air Force together. We came out and went to Boston University together, and we all worked together. Uh, I did uh, some uh, broadcasting for WHAB on football broadcasts, along with Alan Noyce. Joe tried it for a while, he didn't like it, but uh, he still worked for, for the uh, WHAB here in Havel. And, uh, but Alan stayed, uh, when, he, when he, we get, get this job, we all went to Boston University. And Alan entered the uh, uh, ROTC, and he got his commission, and he stayed in as a public relations man and eventually ended up in Barry, Vermont, with a radio station that he was part owner. And he, he became a general of the uh, Air National Guards in uh, Vermont. But he was the biggest flub up the other one of me. <laughs> he, he never made roll call. And you have to appreciate uh, Miami Beach when you were there. Uh, we were sleeping in, in houses. I was ha happened to be a duplex. And he, he was upstairs and I was downstairs. And they'd get us up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and they'd call roll call, and they'd call my name, and I'd say, I'm here. And it's dark out there, but Noyce never would get the roll call. So everybody, one day I'd call, yeah, he's here, and another day another man would call. Well, the sergeant caught on to it. He said, today I don't want anybody to call Noyce's name, because I know he's not down here. Sure enough, they called noise, no be answers. Noise, no be answers. Noise, he makes, makes a loud noise. Noise peeks out of the window from the second story, he says, here, <laughs> he said, come down here. 
<laughs> so we were all restricted to base and everybody was angry at noise and we had to save him from a couple of fellows that wanted to beat the hell out of him. Anyway, his, uh, he was assigned to Washington sidewalk and took a toothbrush and started washing the sidewalk in front of the headquarters. And who comes out? The general comes out and says, what are you doing there? Said, uh, uh, private. He says, I'm washing the sidewalk. He said, with, with a toothbrush? He said, yes. Well, we were restricted again to, from, to the base. Now, here's the Illinois doing all this and ending up as, as a general up in Illinois. <laughs> so one day when I heard about this, I called up and I said, I like to speak to General Lewis. By this time, I had gone to gunnery school. I became a sergeant. He was still a private. And, and we got together a couple of times, and uh, the girl says, uh, well, who's calling? I said, tell him his commanding officer's calling. So he gets on the phone, and uh, he said, General Noyce? He says, yes, sir. Is this your commanding officer? He says, Kassaris, you son of a gun. <laughs> he knew right away who it was. <laughs> so that was a little, a little fun part. Now, being down in Miami, uh, Fort Myers, uh, I had no, never flown the plane. I couldn't have for to, to take a flight that cost probably a dollar down here at the Naval Airport to fly, but who had the money in those days? Uh, we, we grew up during the Depression and all sold newspapers. Right. The Naval Gazette, we, if you sold four gazettes, you'd make a penny. You could only make a quarter of a cent for each newspaper that you would, you would uh, sell. And if you didn't sell all the newspapers, you were stuck with those papers, so you had to stay there until you sold them all. So when I go around the street and I see a penny and I pick it up and people say, why are you picking up the penny? I said, I remember the time I had to sell four newspapers to make that penny. <laughs> well anyway, the, when we got down to uh, uh, Fort Myers, they lined us up on a tarmac and they said, well, who's going to be the first one that's going to fly? Well, in those days they had buck sergeants flying because they, they, they were club offs and uh, instead of getting the officers uh, rating, they kept them as a uh, Sergeants. So I wasn't going to wait around. There was about 20 of us on the tarmac, so I said, I'll go for this. So it was an, an Indian boy who had uh, a buck size rating, and he says, well, how do you want it? You want the works? I says, okay, I'll take the works. I used to ride the, the uh, down at the, the Wildcat down to the Salisbury Beach, the uh, roller, coaster. roller coaster, so I didn't mind it. So, he puts me in an AT-6 as a Texan trainer, and that's where he would, the pilot would be in the front and the gunner would be in the back. And he strapped me and gave me my parachute. And off we take off, he gets over the air base and he made 13 barrel rolls in a row. And I'm over there laughing. And he gets so angry at me, he started every maneuver he could to get me sick. He didn't get me sick, so when I get, when we get down to the ground, you saw 20 green faces. <laughs> People were wondering what was going to happen to them. Well, I said, look, it's a piece of cake. It's a lot of fun. Have a, get up there and enjoy it. Which they did. They went up there and they all enjoyed it very much. Well, now we started our gunnery training and we had to learn how to shoot a 30 caliber machine gun and a 50 caliber machine gun. Before that, when, while we were in Miami, we learned how to shoot a 45, a carbine, and a Springfield rifle. And we had gone all through that training before and got our sharpshooter rating, and that's why we ended up as machine gunners. Well, it get, came the time that we had to fly with a 30 caliber machine gun in an AT-6 Texan, and we'd have to go over the uh, Gulf of Mexico and uh, shoot at a, a target that was being pulled by another AT-6. But on the way over, there'd be three planes, and as we're going over, I know why these fellows were only sergeants, because when they fly over, they, they, they take their wing and put it underneath the other person's wing and try to flip them over. And if you couldn't flip them over, then the other fellow would try to do the same thing. And over there, I'm saying, what, what are they trying to do here? Are they going to kill us all? <laughs> well, anyway, we finally get to the target. And uh, they said, okay, fire away. So we fire at the, at the sock, the big white sock that they had. But those pilots knew exactly, they, they could almost count the 30 caliber guns as to when you finish, because the minute it finished, they take the plane and they flip it over, you'd be hanging out, out of the plane with just a strap holding you up. This happened every time we went out. 
So I asked one of the pilots, I said, you know, what would happen, I said, if the strap broke? He said, that's why you got a parachute. I said, you know, we're flying over the Gulf, we're flying over the Everglades, you know, who's going to find you? He says, it's your luck. <laughs> so that's the type of training we got. <laughs> well, after, after a while, there was a, uh, uh, a colonel that was running the, the, by the name Colonel Spivey. Eventually, he became uh, the general of, uh, of all gunners. And he was supposed to be a, uh, be a specialist on uh, ball turret gunners, top turret gunners and chin turret gunners because at that time most of us were fired by hand and they had developed the turret system and he had helped them develop it and he was trying to improve upon it because they were kind of, the turrets were kind of slow. That when you moved it, the, the turret would come over slowly. It was not like a handheld gun. When you moved it, the whole gun came back. So he was going to try to develop that and, and work it. Uh, uh, work it the better than we had, but the poor guy on, on one of the first missions he went over over to Germany, they shot him down. They knew he was in a plane, he was a general by this time, and he became the highest ranking general in the Air Force that was taken prisoner. And uh, well, anyway, we finally graduated from uh, the uh, gunnery school when we all became sergeants, and they decided to send us to uh, Seymour Johnson Field, North Carolina. That's who was supposed to take uh, engineering training to become uh, engineers on the plane, learning all about motors and what have you. Well, we got the Seymour Johnson Field it was, uh, in June, and it was very, very hot weather. The temperature there, we were there for about 45 days, and in the 45 days, I don't think the temperature went down under 90. Uh, we were in these. Uh, <coughs> We were in these uh, sections, sometimes in tents and so forth, with no, no screens and no windows. And, and uh, they had us going to school from midnight until six in the morning, standing up. I think they were doing this in order to get us acclimated to, to uh, uh, combat. And they kept marching us and putting us through all kinds of uh, calisthenics. Uh, you thought you were in the, in the Army, not in the Air Force, but there, it was really Army training that we would get there. We l learned very little about it, uh, 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 mechanics, but we all graduated as mechanics. But uh, they, had, they had no, they had no uh, uh, engines except one to work on, and uh, it was the beginning of the war. For instance, going back to, to Miami Beach, uh, we were guarding the beach with broomsticks. We didn't, they didn't have guns to give us until my brother saw it, said to me one day, he said, you know, uh, how come you got with broomsticks? He said, don't you know what's happening out there in the ocean? I said, no. He says, well, when you're down here one of these days, you'll see. So one weekend I was down at my brother's place and he, uh, he said, you know, there's submarines out there, German submarines, and they're knocking off oil tankers and freighters and so forth. And one day we did see a, uh, an oil tanker go up in flames. And when I got back to Miami Beach, I said to the sergeant, you're not going to get me to go out with a broomstick anymore. I want a 45, and they issued us all 45s and carbines. And, uh, but see, they didn't have the material for us at that time. They weren't prepared for this. Yeah. So when we uh, finished our training in uh, Seymour Johnson Field, we were heading west for Salt Lake City. So we took a train to Salt Lake City. And from there, they organized us into groups. Now, I, all of my friends that I went to service with, none of them were with me. I happened to be the, the only one out of that whole group that ended up as an aerial gunner. So they, uh, they assigned us from Salt, uh, Salt Lake City down to a place called Pyote, Texas. P-Y-O-T-E, Pyote, Texas. When I wrote home to my, my folks, I said, I'm down in Pyote, Texas, and there's uh, there's only about 10 people who live here and about 100 million cattle. <laughs> there was a King Ranch, I don't know if you ever heard yes. of King Ranch. Yeah. That was the biggest uh, cattle ranch in the, in the world at the time. In fact, uh, when we had a day off, Mr. King used to pick us up in his Cadillac and he'd drive us to San Antonio, which was about 100 miles away, going about 100 miles an hour to get there, and so he could get there in an hour. Well, <clears throat> it, was, it was just a straight road from Pio right into into uh, San Antonio. Well, I arrived. I arrived alone, and it was nighttime. So I was kind of hungry, and they said, "Well, why don't you go to the mess hall?" 
So they showed me where the mess hall was, and I went across the street. And the mess hall just said to me, well, what do you want to eat? Now looking at the mess hall, I see nothing but steaks. <laughs> I, ne I never had had a steak in my life. Uh, growing up in a depression, who could have steak? There six kids in the family, you know. We were lucky to have uh, four, uh, three meals a day at that time. So the sergeant knew that I, what, what was happening, and he says, don't worry, I'll fix you up. So he gave me a beautiful steak with a couple of eggs. You could take that steak and cut it with a spoon. That's how good it was. Well, I was there for 30 days. I ate steak the next three times a day. <laughs> and then when we go to San Antonio, I'd have more steak and eggs. Well, that was the best mess hall I'd ever been to in my life. After 30 days of training there, we're training on uh, B-17s, they uh, finally assigned us to a, to a, uh, a crew. And uh, there was a crew of 10, the pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier and the rest of us were got as engineers and what have you. And they wanted to know who, who, well by this time they had an engineer that had gone to real good engineering school and um, I was his assistant. And uh, they said, who wants to take pictures uh, in the plane? I, I used to take pictures as a kid, so I said I would. They had three cameras on board. Uh, it was a K-20, a K-24, and a movie camera. A K-20, would uh, show the bombs that were just leaving uh, the plane. And the K-24 would take pictures of the actual uh, bombs landing on the target. So that I'd be assigned to doing that type of work when we were in the combat. And then you'd have the movie camera to uh, take whatever pictures you could. Because, you know, when you're in enemy territory, you know, you're nothing but a spy because uh, you, 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 the movie's gonna come back and show we are taken, and, and we we don't we, we couldn't understand what was going on, but the intelligence people did. Well, anyway, we uh, finally they took us and sent us to a second phase training. Uh, first phase was in Pyrot, second phase, and third phase was supposed to be in Delhart, Del Texas, T A L H A R T, Texas. When we got to Delhart, uh, the training became uh, uh, more or less. Uh, combat, flying, and formation, and uh, they would take you up and uh, uh, get that plane up in the air, knock, uh, cut out one or two engines, and see whether, how they would, whether the other two engines could uh, handle the flight and it drop down. Because while this was going on, you better have your parachute on in case something happened. Nothing did happen, but it was very interesting to see this developing. In the meantime, I kept pestering my pilot. I said, you know, I got to learn to fly this plane. And he say, what do you want to fly it for? I said, well, if something happened to you and the co-pilot, somebody else has to take over so we can hold it straight so we can bail out or whatever the case may be. But eventually he said, all right, one day we'll fly to Albuquerque, New Mexico on a, on a simulated bombing run. And it was nighttime. He said, all right, John, come on. I took that B-17 and I flying it all over the sky. <laughs> and the co-pilot was green. He hated to see me do this, but I flew it to Albuquerque, right from Delhi. And uh, was, it hard, was it hard to control? It was very hard. It was like a, uh, like a flying. But don't forget, I never flew. Yeah, right. Even a small plane. Right, yeah. But here, are, here you are, flying four-engine bomber. And uh, eventually, I got it straightened out pretty good. And, uh, and <clears throat> we got it to Albuquerque, and we had a simulated bomb. Can you imagine the people in the Albuquerque not knowing that we had a simulated bomb in Albuquerque? <laughs> Next year, we're going to go. We're going to go to a uh, convention in Albuquerque, so I'll let them know about that. Well, uh, one day, we, on another mission that we had, uh, we had a friend by the name of uh, uh, Bid Fitcher. He came from Washington, the uh, state of Washington. And this guy was a real good pilot. But he was originally used to fly a fighter place, but they put him in bombers. So one day he says to his crew, you see that bridge down by Amarillo? He says, how would you like to fly under that bridge someday? And they agreed to go and do this. Well, he tried to do it, then he realized he couldn't make it. He pulled the plane up, and one of the propellers hit, hit the cable. And somebody got a hold of uh, the, uh, the general of the 2nd uh, Air, Air Force. That's where we were at the time. And by the time we landed, the general was there, lined up all the planes, and found out that Bid's plane was the one that hit that thing because the, the propeller was bent. Well, they 
they court-martialed him, and uh, we went to the court-martial, and they were going to put him in jail. Uh, his crew and our crew went to the court-martial, and we said, if you put him in jail, we refuse to fly combat. Now they've, they've trained us for several months to do this thing, and they weren't about to give two crews up because we were losing so many bombers in Europe at the time, and they needed us badly. In fact, they needed us so badly they didn't even give, give us our third phase training. They, they decided to ship us overseas right away because they ran out of crews. Well, what happened, they made Bit Fitcher fly. He became a lead pilot, and he never got a promotion. He, no, he finally made first lieutenant. This man should have come out as at least a colonel, but he finally came out as a first lieutenant because in his record, they had that in his record, no promotions, but they didn't put him in jail. Anyway, we, as I said, we were losing so many planes, uh, especially in Schweinfurt. They had a, it was October, I guess, of 1943, and they flew a Schweinfurt mission, and that's where Colonel Speedy, who had become general, and he was a head uh, gunner expert for the U.S. government. That's where he got shot down. They claimed there were 60 bombers shot down that day. And we figured it'd be close to 100. Now you talk about how many people are being killed in Iraq right now. Well, this was done in one day in uh, just the Air Force. The 8th Air Force lost 50,000 men. Out of 75,000, I think, that were killed in World War II. More were killed by the, in the 8th Air Force than all the other Air Forces, Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard combined. And uh, we had some real bad missions like Schweinfurt. Did, did Schweinfurt. that worry you, knowing that the, the, the odds, I mean, the odds weren't, were, were terribly against you guys. I mean, did, did that play into your mind as you were oh, shipping yeah. out? It's like The problem is that uh, we were flying deep into Germany by this time. All of my missions were in Germany. Uh, the original uh, uh, the groups that went over. Went now, when did you France. ship? When did you ship overseas? I shipped over November of 1943, right after the Schweinfurt mission. And you were stationed in England. And we were stationed in England. What happened is, what they they took us to uh, uh, Nebraska, and we picked up a plan, new plane in Nebraska, and from there we flew to Detroit. From Detroit, uh, they split the crew. They they got two, uh, two planes for us to fly overseas in. And we were being flown over by ATC pilots. That was the Air Traffic Transfer Command. These were commercial airline pilots. Uh, they didn't, uh, as I said, we, our training was so quick that uh, we'd never got our third phase, so they didn't uh, allow my pilot and co-pilot to fly a plane over. They had to have a, they had to have a, a split up, and we split into two groups. And uh, we t took two planes over. They could use. They needed the planes anyway because they were going. They were getting beat up. So uh, when we when we were flying from Detroit, uh, I was acting engineer on that plane. So I I said to the pilot, I said, uh, you know, I think we're going to have an oil leak when we get near Grenier Air Base because I live in Havel. He said, What do you want to do? Land in Grenier? I said, uh, So we landed in Grenier, and I tried to get off. And the colonel in the base wouldn't let me off. He said, security reasons. I said, I'm going to go anyway. If you, if you go, you're going to be locked up. I said, that's all right by me. So I, I left the base, called my brother up. He came, picked me up. I stayed overnight and I went back up there again. Next day, they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> so I happened to be in a position where my uh, bombardier was in my group, was going down to take a shower. And I called, hey, Ted Kroll. His name was Ted Kroll. It's Ted. They won't let me on a base. He said, wait a minute. He went back and got his uniform on. He came back. He said, I demand you let this man on a base. He said, we can't do it unless the colonel comes by. So they brought the colonel by. He said, I have a meaning to put you in jail. I said, it's okay by me. I'm going to go over and get shot up anyway, so you may as well put me in jail. I don't care. But they need me over there. He said, I'm glad you guys are flying out of here tomorrow. <laughs> so the next day we flew out. And we ended up in Presque Isle, Maine. And for Prescott Isle, Maine, Maine, we landed in Gander, Newfoundland. And it was, the temperature in Gander was about 30 below zero when we got there. So they pulled up a, a heated truck next to us and got us off the plane. And they brought us to a mess hall to eat. And uh, I'm, I'm walking to the mess hall in the line and somebody taps me behind my back. 
turn around a fellow named Mitchison. His his son is the is a counselor, right? Well, Mitch was stationed in <laughs> in he the Newfoundland for about a year. He didn't like it very much. But next day he said, Why don't we go out skating? So we went out and did some skating and they said, Well, tomorrow we're flying out of here so I I you know, we're gonna be in Europe by Christmas, so uh, I'll see you later. Well, we got up ready to take off the very next day and the first plane that took off blew up. And I don't know if you ever heard of Lord Ha Ha, have you? No. Well, <coughs> there was an Englishman by the name of Lord Ha Ha who became a traitor and he joined up with the Nazis and he'd be broadcasting uh, every day about who's flying where and what they're doing and like the Schweitzer mission, he knew all about that before they flew out. And uh, he said, well, he got on the radio and we picked it up and he says, well, every one of your pilots are going to take off from Uganda and he named the pilots. Uh, as you take off, you're all going to blow up like that other plane. But we never knew whether that plane was uh, deliberately bombed or not. But we did guard duty that night, checked the plane as best we could. And you can imagine our anxiety oh, sure. to, to, to take off the next day. And Well, they, as I said, they split off. There was only, at that time, there was only my, my uh, bombardier, myself, and the two pilots that flew that plane over. And I was the only gunner on there with no guns. And we were flying from Gander to, to, uh, to Scotland. And what happened is that uh, it was the most beautiful night you can imagine. And I had a Reader's Digest and I was reading the Limburg story about we. And I never knew that we happened to be a mosquito. He flew over with a mosquito that kept buzzing him all the way across. I thought we meant his airplane and himself, but that wasn't it. And he was about to kill that mosquito until he realized that that mosquito was keeping him alive and left that mosquito alone. A, a couple of times he fell asleep going over and, and he came out of it because the mosquito buzzed him. And uh, it was a very interest, interesting story, but when we got close to, uh, to uh, England, they told me I'd better go back and observe if there's any German planes coming at us. So I went down the tail section of the plane. The other three are out in the front part of the plane, and I'm having a ball sitting down in the tail section looking for the German planes, which he saw none. And we landed in Scotland without any, any problem. We got there, we joined with the rest of our group. They sent us down to a place called Valley Wales. From there, we ended up at our base, which is near Kettering, England, and Corby, England. The town was Dingthorpe, D-E-E-N-E-T-H-O-R-P-E, -E -E, Dingthorpe. Very small town, and uh, this is where we joined uh, our four first bomb group. They put us in, the, there was four squadrons there. Uh, ours was a 612, they had the 613, 614, 615. And uh, the day that we arrived, uh, an American plane bomber took off and crashed in the town of Deanthorpe. They, fortunately, no, no one got killed. The uh, crewmen all ran out of, out of the plane. They, they, they contacted every, every member of that town they got them out of there before the plane blew up. Uh, it, it was about about an hour or so uh, later that the plane blew up without a soul getting hurt. And uh, they, had, they had quite a story about that in England. So they took us out there in Dean Thorpe and we became a, a combat ready uh, crew by training further there. We went up to the wash up in the northern part of uh, of England, and this, we were practicing our gunnery and so forth, and eventually they decided it's time for me to fly. So Frankfurt, Germany was my first mission. And uh, by this time we had lost our chief engineer. I don't know what had happened and they had to replace him with another engineer, and I was happy they did because I wasn't that great an engineer, I was a better photographer. So <clears throat> on our way to uh, uh, well, when you, when you get ready to fly, you, they get you up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they run you down to the mess, or mess hall and they give you uh, fresh eggs. And because they don't know whether you're coming back anymore, whether you can have another meal. 
this is the last time you're going to have any eggs. And uh, they uh, get us into a briefing room and uh, open up a, a, a big map, which is covered with a curtain. And when the general or the colonel comes in, he's going to tell you where you're going to fly. Uh, that you, you're in there with all the pilots, the co-pilots, the navigators, everybody's there. And uh, they, the colonel pulls the, the string where uh, covering the, the map of Europe, and there's a red ribbon pointing to your target, and how you're going to get to the target, which way you're going in. And that day it happened to be Frankfurt. Hey, everybody hated to go to Frankfurt. It was a, it was a danger. I flew there three times, and each time was a, a dangerous mission. So we, we get ready to go, and now you go down to uh, the, the cloakroom, and you get yourself your parachute, you get your May West, and you get your flak jackets and so forth, and your guns, and off you're supposed to go. To, they caught you by, by truck to the uh, B-17s. I get in the B-17, my machine gun was already on. Well, I didn't know that I should have checked it, because they have an ar armor that, come, they, that would come in and set it up for you. But the armor set it up wrong for me, and I had no idea of this. Because when you go over the, the channel, the English Channel, what would happen, you're supposed to warm up your gun to see if it's working properly. If it isn't, you're supposed to repair it and, and uh, try again. Well, the minute I was flying over the English Channel, I test fired my gun, and the armor had set it up wrong, and the whole gun came back in my chest, and it was pointed right at the, at, at the tail gunner. Fortunately, I turned the safety switch off. For some reason or other, I did it automatically, and the gun stopped firing. Otherwise, it would have been a runaway gun. I could have shot down two or three planes, who knows, including ours. Fortunately, nobody knew about it except the gunner behind me and I, and we finally found out what he did wrong. He had taken the <coughs> you're supposed to have a round knob and tighten it up, and this, this portion was supposed to be, the V should have been towards me, instead he pointed it the other way around, and that's why it came apart. I, it was just stupid on my part that I didn't check it, but yeah, you're nervous, ready to go on your first mission, and there's a lot of things you don't think about, but there's a million and one things you should be thinking about. That's the question I wanted to ask, too, is what, what was going through your mind on your very first mission, and, and knowing that, once again, that the odds were, were against you, and, and what, what was, emotionally, what, what were you and your, your crew thinking? Well, basically what it is, there's so many things you have to do. Uh, you have to get all your equipment. You got what kind of a what kind of a parachute do you want? You want an American type parachute? You want an English type parachute? Well, in my case, I had questioned the people that set up the uh, parachutes. The problem with the English parachute was that the Irish worked on the base and they hated the English. Uh, they, they always have, and they had found a couple of times that the, the Irish had sewed the D ring to the point where you couldn't pull it to open it up. They weren't doing this to the American shoes, but they were doing it to the English shoes. So if you wanted to wear uh, a British type uh, parachute, which I like better than the American, and I'll tell you why in a minute, uh, I would check to see. They, they, they showed me how to check it. You'd have to open it. So you got a million things to think about. Hey, listen, is this, this going to open up? If, <laughs> if it doesn't, I don't want this parachute, I want another one. But the reason I wanted the English parachute was the fact that the American shoe. You, you have to clip it on. You have th three clips, one clip here, one on the leg, and one here. So if you get shot up like I did, you, you wouldn't be able to use your hands to un unbuckle it. You could be dragged, uh, the wind could drag you from, from a, you know, quite a distance. But the English parachute, you had a, a round knob, and they had four angles that would connect to this knob. And if you turn it to the red and bang it like this, it collapsed. Well, I'll tell you when, when I get shot down what happened. I'll yeah. explain that to you later on. But you have so many things to think about. Then your May West, you have to check to see that if that, there's leaks in it. Or you see that it's uh, you blow it up and see whether or not it's working. You got to get your your uh, uh, <coughs> your vest to see whether you know the protective armor vest. And I always took two of them with me. I used to stand on one and put the other one on. I weighed about 34 pounds. You know, all that will do is save you from a, a piece of shrapnel that came out of it if it sure. wasn't traveling yeah. too fast. <clears throat> well, 
and he, I had no Greek priest there. Uh, yeah. Greeks were not even recognized during World yeah. War II. <laughs> they used Protestant, Jewish, or Catholic. So I'd, I'd go to the Catholic uh, priest for absolution, for absolution. The oddest thing that happened, I got to know that, I got to know two people there, very, very good friends of mine. One was the, uh, the Irish Cat, uh, Catholic priest. The other one was the intelligence officer. Well, I didn't find out though, 60 some odd years later, that he originally came from Havel. And he still has family in Havel here. I happened to pick up a book and I was reading it. And I got his name, four for his bottom with his name and so forth. Havel, Massachusetts. He was a retread from World War I. You know, he was in his, you know, like, he was probably in his 50s. And they had him in uh, World War II. But that I'll was the oddest thing that ever yeah. happened. You know? Well, go through absolution, that was the last step before you get to your plane. Get on your plane, now you got to check everything on the plane. You check for gasoline, see if you got enough gasoline. Uh, how far you going, you have to know how many gallons you got on it. That was your responsibility? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, as an engineer, the, uh, as, a, as the assistant engineer, I checked to see whether or not the, the propellers were uh, shaped and not, not bent or anything, uh, the airlines and so forth, the tires. Uh, uh, everything had to be checked out. In fact, in many, many cases, you'd have to uh, put in more gasoline uh, to see that it was loaded if you'd taken a trip into Berlin, which is further, further to Frankfurt and um, see that you had plenty of gasoline in there. Because the, the plane's sitting there loaded up with gasoline from the night before, uh, for some reason or other. And you, you could put another 10, 15, 20 gallons in that after it sat, sat all night, and you needed all that gasoline. So uh, finally, you get on the plane and then off you go. Uh, the next step is, uh, are we going to be able to take off? Because you got so much gasoline, so many bombs on there and uh, <clears throat> so much weight, and uh, a lot of planes just couldn't make it. They just just couldn't take off. they crack up on takeoff. we would lose a lot of planes that way. Mm. Fortunately, in all my missions that I went on, our plane took off. And then you'd have to circle over England and farm with all the other, other planes coming from other divisions and other wings and other uh, bomb groups. And uh, most of the time over England, it'd be cloudy. Now you You'd be going through the clouds with hundreds and hundreds of airplanes and you're hoping you're not going to hit and you got to keep your eyes wide awake to see whether or not there's any planes near you. And uh, finally when you get above above the clouds, that's when you start formulating into a uh, into striking force. Yeah, the, the Americans uh, always bomb during the day and the British at night, that's correct? That's right. Okay. But we would stop, uh, we would probably take off 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning, but by the time we got into France, it was daylight, and then going, as I said, we flew every mission we flew was in Germany. So, you know, those missions could last 10, 12 hours, and uh, probably eight hours were probably an auction, and with an auction mass. That's another thing we had to check on. Right. See, we yeah. had enough auction in the plane. And that the walk around bottles, you had a, if you had a walk around for some reason or other, you connect to a walk around bottle, you have to check to see if there's any auction in them, because sometimes they may not load them up. So, there's some. So many things to think about, and uh, well, as I said, when I test fired the gun on that first mission, we got straightened out, and uh, we went into Frankfurt, and uh, it was uh, it was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I took my pictures and came out. We 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 didn't meet very very much opposition except on the way back. On the way back, the ME 109 came at us, and I took a shot at it, and I hit its tail the tail of assembly of the plane, and it just flipped up like that. And, uh, but as it went by, I called the tail gun, and the tail gun says, he's still flying, but he's not coming back. So I never knocked it down, apparently, but he might, he might have bailed out later on, I yeah. don't know. So all I did is report the fact that I damaged the plane. And, uh, but that's the only plane I ever hit while firing a gun, because the others were too far away from, this one came very close, and took a good shot at it. But that was the only time we had any uh, opposition, the first mission. But the flak was something else. Yes, talk about the flak. The flak was just unbelievable, you know. You say, how in the world aren't we getting shot down with this flak? Right, it's yeah. hitting the bottom of the yeah. plane, you could hear it hitting, coming through the plane, 
You know, well, a couple of missions later, I got a piece of flat that went right across my nose here. And if you look at that picture up there, if you see me in my uniform, um, I, <coughs> you'll, you'll see a scar right there. Um, yeah, and I was just watching it, it didn't hit my eyes. So, but that happened a couple of missions later in Brunswick, Germany. So we we flew, I flew something like 12 missions of the B-17 with the Berlin, uh, uh, Wilmshaw, the Kiel, Augsburg, uh, Frankfurt three times. Uh, I can't remember all of them, but uh, Hanover. Uh, one mission I flew in a B-24. That was the only mission I flew in a B-24. In the B-24, the Liberator could fly faster than a B-17. Had it could carry more weight, two more bombs. Uh, it could fly circles around the B-17. But we all loved the B-17 because it could take a lot of damage. You could fly it. You could fly it with one, two, three engines. Uh, one engine you can almost land it with one engine going. Uh, it happened so often that the just developed with us. You never thought you'd make it across, but somehow or other the pilot would land it. Well, the, the, the mission that I got shot down was on March 20th, 1944. And that was another mission to Frankfurt. But just prior to that, I had a flight with another group. What happened? So many people got shot up. I had flown two days in a row to uh, Berlin, and the third day, we were supposed to have off, so we went to town that night. And there was a nice pub by the name of Weechee Pub in town. And we had a good time. We didn't get it till 1 o'clock in the morning. And we had had a few drinks. And at <coughs> 4 o'clock in the morning, Casares, you're on. I said, what do you mean I'm on? Uh, <coughs> my, my crew's not flying today. Yeah, but you're flying replacement. Now, I had a fly replacement in, in Kale and Charlie Purple Hot Con. I don't know if you know what that is. This is the first mission that this crew had to fly. And one of the gunners couldn't make it, he was sick, and they, and they put me on. I had had about 13, 14 missions by this time. And that poor pilot had to fly to Berlin, and he was tailed in Charlie at Fair Black Farm, which was the last place plane in the formation. That's the first plane that the Germans would come out after you. So we get up there, and and he, we were over the English Channel. He's probably a hundred yards behind the, the, the next plane. So I called up and I said, uh, uh, got up to pilot. I says, you know, we're coming to the English Channel uh, and we're going to be in Germany with, uh, in France in just a few minutes. And you better get that plane in. And so he brings it up close and two, two minutes later he's back again. Poor guy didn't have enough training, see. So now we're over France and I said to him, Got up to pilot. We got to get that plane in. We got, you know, we got to get flak pretty soon. And uh, right after the flak, you're going to get German pa German planes. And I, I did this to him three times. The third time, he says, "Gunner, if you don't keep your mouth shut, you're going to get court martial when you get back." I hate to tell you what I said to him. I said, "God damn it! Get your fanny in there, or I'll come up and fly that plane for you." I get in there, and the minute I said that, a plane came right out of the sun. And right across the whole side of our plane, he just wiped out part of the plane. And fortunately, nobody got, nobody got hurt. You should have seen that pilot take that plane in pretty close. And <laughs> we went to building and back. And I got down to the ground. I kissed the ground. And he came up to me. And he says, Sergeant, I want to apologize to you. I says, Lieutenant, I said, today we made a pilot out of you, a, a combat pilot. I never saw him again. Uh -huh. Well, the next day, uh, or two, three days later, we had to go to Frankfurt. And it was March 20th, 44. And uh, it was a terrible day. When we took off, we were up 27,000 feet. And uh, What's it like inside the plane? Because they weren't, it w wasn't heated or pressurized, correct? Oh, no, 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 you had open windows. Yeah. And the temperature in the plane could go between uh, 40 and 70 below zero. And uh, you would be uh, in heated suits provided they work. And a lot of times they didn't work. And you couldn't, you couldn't touch that gun or any metal with, without a glove on. Your hand would stick right to it. If you pulled it out, all your skin would come off. So you, you couldn't do that. 
and uh, everything you did would be to, uh, 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 you had to be very careful. For instance, uh, one of the missions just before the last mission, uh, the till gunner got off oxygen, and we'd have an oxygen check. So I'd call up and say, now let's have an oxygen check. And so the pilot said, I'm on oxygen. The co-pilot said, I'm on oxygen. Navigator, a bomber, a radio, the, uh, the tail gunner never answered. So, so I looked back and I saw him slumped over. I said, uh, this is the right, I was flying right ways gunner that day. He said, uh, I said, right ways gunner pilot. It looks like uh, Benz, his name was Marvin Benz, is, uh, is off auction. He says, go back and check him out. Now you got to get the auction, the auction bottle, the walk around, put it on and crawl through all the space to get to him. And sure enough, he was off auction. And I had to revive him. I had to put the auction mask back on him. I was there with 10 minutes trying to give him artificial respiration. I got him, I got him awake and then he started fighting me because he was off auction. And he was a big guy, six foot two, 180 some odd pounds. I only weighed about 135, 140 pounds. And uh, <clears throat> finally I ran out of auction, so the navigator came back and brought me another auction bottle to help me out. We got him back and he was straightened up. But by this time, we were sucking up so much auction, helping this guy, that the, the plane was running out of auction, except the back part of the plane. So we had to go to the front part of the plane, walk through the Bombay doors, which is, yeah. the Bombay doors just, there was only a, a walker about that wide. And without a parachute on, you couldn't go through with a parachute, it was so narrow. And go load up the auction bottles and bring them back so, so we could survive back there. And we did this maybe six or seven times in order to survive. And uh, things like that would happen all the time, you know. Well, anyway, I got a big commendation for that. I'm still waiting for my distinguished flying cross that they were supposed to give me, but I left England too early to get it. But they never did. Some one of these days will probably send it to me and you'll see a picture of the paper and say, John, finally got his DFC. <laughs> I was anxious to get home by that time. Well, anyway, the, um, I got into uh, the, the Franklin mission on the last day of March 20th. The, the, the weather was so bad. At 27,000 feet, we were just skimming a cold front. A cold front of clouds all the way up to 27,000 feet. You fly on planes, and you would fly up about 10,000 feet, all clears up, you see the sun. Well, there was no sun. And we're just skimming on top of that at 27,000. It's as high as a plane could go. Maybe we'd gone up to 32 or 1,000 feet at one point. But, but you'll bounce up and down all over the sky. I, I don't know why they never recalled us. I tried to get into a secondary target, but they didn't do it until a plane above us came down and almost hit us, and my pilot went into a dive to, to avoid him. When he got into a dive, we went down well over 1,000, 1,500 feet before he pulled it out. And by the time we got back up, there were no planes in sight. So the decision was to go into Frankfurt. That was, the 8th Air Force claimed they bombed Frankfurt on March 20th, 1944. We were the only planes that bombed it that day. And what had happened, the rest of them were all caught, recalled, and we never get the recall. They're, they had been told the recall uh, right after we we went and we avoided that plane up above. We went at the Frankfurt. How did you manage to miss the? the what? How did you manage to miss the the recall? The, your radio wasn't radio, working. Whether or? the radio, maybe we, we were in that drop. And the radio man probably fell off his oh, okay. chair. Who knows? Uh, he might yeah, have been yeah. off. They never got it. Apparently, they, he, they must have sent it to us. Yeah. But because we were in a dive, the radio man never got it. So when we got up there, we just went into Frankfurt. And don't you think, the minute we got into Frankfurt, it opened up. The skies opened up. The whole sky opens up. We bombed Frankfurt. Ack Ack knocks out one of our uh, motors. On the way back, we're fighting the the German Air Force, we're fighting them all the way back to Reims, France. We'd run out of ammunition. Now, by this time, I get shot up a couple of times, my arm, my back, my leg, and uh, the, the tail gunner was killed. The top turret gunner was killed. 
the left way he's got a got a 20 millimeter right in his neck and I try to help him out and the blood just gushed out of him and it was probably 60 below zero at the time and it congealed quickly but, but uh, the, field, the the radio man got hit uh, something hit him in the leg and the um, by this time we got the the uh, authority to bail out of the plane. So what happened, the ball turret operator got stuck in a ball turret because there's all gears there and he was trying to get it up and by we were firing so, so many rounds that the shells, the empty shells were going into his gears and they get clogged up in there. So now I'm, I'm all banged up. The radio man is banged up and we're trying to get all those things out of there. We're trying to get the, 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 the left waist gunner to bail out as well. And there's nothing we could do with a hill gunner. He was dead, uh, and we were in the back part of the plane. People in the front part of the plane trying to take care of the other people over there. And what happened? We finally got the ball turret coming up, and the radio man says, "Go ahead, John." He knew I was badly injured, so I I opened up the the uh, rear door, and because it's only a small rear door, and. Uh, when you bail out, you got to make certain when you bail out, you fall out and you drop yourself down so you won't hit part of the airplane. Well, I bailed out and passed out. Now, we were, we were about 25,000 feet. I saw the plane on fire and going down. And uh, what happened is that uh, I didn't come to until I got down below where the, there was enough oxygen to be. So it must have been maybe five, three, four thousand feet. I must have fallen four, four miles before I woke up and, uh, and then I had all kinds of trouble pulling my parachute because my right arm was shot and I couldn't, I couldn't pull the D-string. I got very short arms, 32 inch arms and I had all kinds of trouble reaching over to get that D-string to open it up. I just barely did it. I don't know if I, 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 must, I, I did my prayers two or three times and finally God gave me the strength to open it up. And when I opened it up, I was going down so fast, and you have, you know, you don't have the parachutes that you have today that float you down and make it easy for you. When you open it up, it, bang, just like that. I broke six ribs when I when I opened it up, and I came down so fast. And I hit the ground. Fortunately, when I hit the ground, this this young fella was plowing the field, and I landed in the plowed area. Thank God I did, because I just fractured one ankle and I banged another one. I banged my back. Otherwise, I never would have made it. If it was a hard ground, I never would have made it, because I came down so hard. And when I listened, hit the ground, a German plane comes flying over me, and I thought it was, he was about to shoot me. It was a German plane, an ME-109, the ones that shot us down. Came by three times and he saluted me. He was from here to that tree away from me. That I can see his face to this day. In fact, I'm trying to find out who this pilot was because he came by three times and, to give my position away. And each time he came by, he saluted me. Now I go back to the English type parachute. The dr wind is pulling me, pulling my parachute. I'm on the ground and badly injured. I was on my deathbed at this time. But I had enough strength to turn that knob with my left hand bang it so that the parachute would collapse. Even with the broken ribs out, it had to hurt when you, yeah. you banged it. You don't have to bang it that high. Oh, okay. Just go out there. But hey, listen, you got to get out of it. Yeah. So if I had the American parachute, this I'd still be getting dragged because I could never have yeah. I'd clip it. So the, the English parachute saved me. Well, what happened on a plane, I found out later on, the there was one more shell still in that gear. And when the radio operator was coming out like this, he was kind of a big fella. He wasn't—he was about my size. I, you know, my size. You know, I flew the, the ball through one time, I, and I froze to death. They had to put him in the, in the hospital for a week after that. It's just so—it's so small. You had, you had to fly like this, and you'd be in there six, seven hours, and it's you know, 60 below zero, and you're, there's no heat there. And um, when he tried to get out, that one shell 
wouldn't let him open open up enough to pipe the bill up. Lucky the uh, the radio man had him pulled up, and he pulled that out the last second and get him out, and then they threw the, the both of them threw the uh, Luftwaffe gunner out. But what happened with the Luftwaffe gunner? He was so badly injured that when he got close to the ground, it started warming up, and he's uh, bled to death. Yeah, wow. yeah so he was, he, they got him on a hospital, but he never made it. The um, ball tour operator uh, bailed out, and uh, before he bailed out, his parachute came undone in a plane. And it, he had to gather it up with his hands, and then fly it, uh, fall out of the plane, let it go, and fortunately it opened up. The uh, navigator was thrown, it was injured, and he was thrown out by the bombardier. But we don't know whether or not the parachute ever opened up or whether he was killed by uh, before, he, before he was thrown out or whether they shot him coming down. We had no idea. The, uh, the uh, radio man bailed out. The uh, pilot and co-pilot bailed out. But about a minute after we, we bailed out, the plane blew right up. We were flashing to the other in time we did, otherwise we'd have been roasted. Anyway, I was the only one that day that was captured. I was captured immediately by the Gestapo, and uh, they brought me to a to a uh, farmhouse. And I landed in a place called La Bonne Maison, the good house, a big farm. And during World War One, the area which I landed was a was a was a flat area, and they the the French Air Force had an air base there. And the number one ace who shot down 78 German planes flew out of that base. This is uh, Colonel Rickerbacker, the American ace shot like 20 some odd planes down. This Frenchman shot 78 of them down. <laughs> and they got a plaque memorized in, the, in that, that, that area. The, the, uh, the radio operator was captured immediately. When he bailed out, he bailed out and there was an ACAC gun right below him <laughs> as he was landing. The, the German soldiers were there just waiting for him. <laughs> so they took him in and locked him up. The, the uh, ball turret operator had another bad uh, situation. When he came down after, opened up, you know, after the parachute finally opened up, can you imagine what he's going through being stuck in that ball turret? Then his, then his, uh, his parachute opens up in a plane. He comes out, finally gets down. As he comes down, he gets a high tension wire. The parachute got high tension wire, and he flops into a picket fence and got gouged right here. And then he couldn't go anywhere. So they, some little kid came by in a wheelbarrow and tried to hide him, but uh, they finally had to give him up to the uh, to the Germans so he could get some medical treatment. Well, they those two became prisoners of war for well over a year, and. Uh, they had to go uh, death marches before the, the war ended. They had a, one of the men who walked 500 miles to the American lines. And you heard about the uh, Japanese death marches. There was G German death mm -hmm. marches you never heard about. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of them that got killed in that death march. Because they came from all camps of the war. Uh, some of them walked 500 miles, some walked 200 miles, some walked 100 miles. Well, what happened to my uh, uh, pilot and co-pilot, they were captured, but they were sent to officers, an officer's camp. The other two were sent to a, a, a sergeant's camp, and uh, we didn't hear anything about them until after the war. My bombardier uh, landed and, and fractured his ankle when he landed, and he walked quite a distance maybe 10, 15 miles, to finally he had, he had to stop and knock on somebody's door. They took him in and they hit him out. The French on the ground hit him out. And uh, he eventually was uh, uh, evaded and the Americans landed and he joined up with them and finally got back to base. Uh, what happened to me is that uh, uh, there's no way I could make it. I was, as I said, I was on my deathbed. And then Gestapo came in to question me as to who I was and so forth. 
they weren't going to get anything out of me because I, I was in such bad shape. They, but every day they would come in and question me and question me and question me. And this went on for I don't know how many days. Wait, at the same time, though, were they giving you proper medical treatment? And I or? wasn't getting any medical treatment. That was a torture that you were going through. No doctor. I said to him, doctor, doctor. I said, doctor. Finally, they brought a doctor and he came in and he said to me, we're going to have to amputate your right arm. You're getting gangrene. And he took some white powder and put it on my arm. Maybe that helped me. I think it did. Because a few days later, three mem members of the underground came in, all carrying guns. One came in, cut telephone wires. Apparently, the people I was with at that house were uh, pro Nazi. And uh, they must have contacted the uh, the Gestapo as well. That's mm -hmm. why they were there so quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they locked these people up. They shot up a, a guard. Then on the way out, there was a change of guard coming, and they had a firefight going on. Crap! I got hit again in my back with a I don't know whether a piece of steel or something must have come through the car that I was in. Hit me right back in the back here. And uh, but we we escaped. They brought me to another farmhouse. But by this time. I don't know how I was alive. The only reason I think I was alive is because I was 20 years old. If it was, if I was older than that, I never would have made it because I had lost a lot of blood. I, and, uh, so when they brought me to the farmhouse, this must have been almost a week later, and uh, they, uh, I was groaning and moaning, and by this time it was nighttime, and they said, well, they brought this English-speaking teacher to the house. And, her name was Madame Ramoge, and she said to me, the Germans are bivouac next door, that we're going to have to turn you over to the Germans because we, we, can't, we can't treat you tonight. But if you can keep quiet, we'll try to get you treatment tomorrow morning. So I said, muzzle me. I made him muzzle me. I haven't had anything to eat or drink in all that time, so finally, they never gave me anything when I was in the farmhouse. If I asked them for water, instead of giving me water, they gave me a little wine, then they gave me a little beer. I want the water. I was dehydrated. Yeah, no yeah. So bad, you know? And so finally, I said, just muzzle me. So that's what they did. They muzzled me, and I was fighting that muzzle all night long. And I was passing out, coming to, passing out. Finally, the next morning, a fellow by the name of Polo, his name was, P-O-L-O, -O, comes up with a huss and buggy. And the, uh, French underground people that saved me. One was Jean Jolie, who was head of the Reims, uh, three French fighters. If you look up there, you'll see some of the medals that they got. And uh, <coughs> the other one was uh, Pierre de Marche, uh, who was a great guy. All three of them were great. And Rene Felix, those are the three guys that saved me that, that day. Then they brought me to Rene Felix's farmhouse. And that's where the, the Germans were big bivouac next door. But Polo takes me by bus and buggy down in back of the Reims Cathedral in Reims. There was a little clinic there. They brought me into this clinic and they had a doctor operate on me three times. Every time I had trouble with anesthesia, and I don't know if it's because of what I went through there. I would come through during the, the operation and they'd have to wait for the next day to, to, to get more anesthesia to, to operate again. And the next day they kept telling me, we're going to try to save your arm, try to save your arm. By this time, all I wanted to do is just get that anesthesia in me so I could really get relieved of the pain, you know. So, the, so three days they did this, and the third day I still had very little water to drink. They had no, no medication to give you. No painkillers. Uh, I, I needed some water. I reached up and I, I, I grabbed hold of the, the button and I pressed the button. And I wasn't supposed to do that. I had no idea this. They, they said that we, they told me, but who knows? I was in no condition to understand what they were saying. And they're speaking to me in French anyway. Uh, <clears throat> and I was in a room that I, nobody was supposed to be in, and the people that were, that were in charge of the hospital. Not the owner, but the people who were in charge for pro-Nazi. 
and they ran upstairs. They took me out. They put me in, put me in my beat up uniform. I had a coverall. And they stuck me out in the street and they put me on the sidewalk, and I ended up in a gutter. So now here it is Saturday afternoon, uh, Saturday evening, and I'm in a gutter. And German soldiers are walking by with French dates and so forth, looking at me. They must have thought I was an alcoholic, you know. And finally, after a while, the young fellow and this girl came out and picked me up, and he dragged me uh, into a a, a French uh, Calvary uh, jail, and they they brought me up, pushed me upstairs, and they locked me into one of the cells. But there was a bed in the cell. I just cocked right out, and uh, I was there for uh, about a week. And once a day, somebody would come and give me a little something to eat, a little something water to drink, and. Uh, there was an old gendarme in there that used to manage the place, apparently. And he'd come and talk to me in French and then he'd go to sleep. But I was there for about a week and they finally came in and they said to me, you can't, if you're going to get up, don't go near the window. There was bars in the windows. But they didn't want me to go near the windows because there was a park out there. There was a Calvary. Uh, during World War One. there was a Calvary. Uh, uh, Facility. So at this point, are these people still? Are these still the French Resistance? Now these people here were a total different group than the French Resistance that saved me and put me in, in that uh, in, in, the, in the clinic. So what happened is that uh, there were there were so many different cells that you never knew what cell you were in, and one cell didn't know the other cell. They might have only one person may know who was in charge of the other cell because. If they broke up one cell, they didn't want to get broken up. So if, if, if you gave one cell away, the other one wouldn't be, uh, uh, would not be captured either. So what happened is that uh, one day, after about a week in that, uh, uh, that room, or jail if you want to call it, this fellow walks in, looked like a cavalry uh, officer, dressed up in, in that uniform. And he demanded to know who I was. And this is where I had made my mistake. I had answered somebody by saying, yeah. And, and more than once I said, yeah, yeah. Now they got worried. They thought that I was German. And the reason why is that a lot of the Germans who were injured would volunteer to bail out over France and hope to connect with the French underground so they could break up that cell. So they didn't know whether I was one of those guys. But what happened is that uh, I wouldn't give them any information. All of a sudden, a couple of days later, he came by twice and demanded. He said, if we don't, if we don't get the answer we offer them, we're going to shoot you. I thought they were kidding. But they brought this man in Ramon who could speak a little English. And she said, I don't know if you understand what these people are saying, but tomorrow morning they're going to shoot you. You've got to give them some information to prove you are an American. Well, with that, I said, okay, here's the situation. I come from the 4th Bomb Group, 612 Squadron, Deep Top, 8th Air Force. Now, if you fly over our air base, and you look down at our air base, it looks like a pistol. And at the end of the pistol, there's three little lakes. It looks like three bullets being fired out of that lake. <clears throat> so, apparently, they checked it out and found out that I was who I said I was, and by this time the original fellows that saved me found out what happened, and they came up, they came to that jail to get me out. Uh, disruption there as we changed the tapes. So uh, where we left off, you had uh, the original group that uh, French Resistance that had saved you uh, found you uh, where you were again, and you can continue with the story. Well, one of the three uh, original fellows that saved me uh, came in. His name is Pierre. Uh, Damoche, and he got into a, a, a loud <coughs> uh, interlude with the people there and uh, demanded that, that he should take me away, and that I shouldn't be in that prison, and that, uh, <coughs> that he would take care of me. And uh, before that, it, uh, Easter was coming about, 
and he wanted to take me down to uh, Easter dinner down at the uh, down to Rene Felix's house, the house that I went to after I had, uh, they had uh, uh, after I had escaped the first time. So they decided to take me there. They they, they released me from that uh, group. How were you feeling uh, physically at this? No, I'm starting to, I'm starting to walk a little, and uh, not very much. But uh, they brought me by. Paul came in and uh, they took me to St. John, John the Baptist Church in Reims. I said, what am I doing here? You know? They took me there Easter Sunday. And just to get they a tie by we're, solution. <laughs> we're, we're talking uh, Easter of 44, correct? 1944. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. And they took me there. My God, the place is loaded with Germans. <laughs> and there I am. <laughs> Finally, they, we, we went to Mass there. And, uh, what, did they dress you up as a Frenchman? Yeah, is that oh, how it's? Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, then they finally, uh, I got absolution from a priest, and then we ended up at that house. When we got to the house, they brought out a bottle of champagne that was about this high. And they said they wanted me to take the cock off. The cock was about this big. I'm trying to take it off. I had my, my right arm is still in the cast. I had no strength. To take it. I, I was there for half an hour trying to get it out. I couldn't get it out. So finally they opened it up. And we all had champagne. It's the worst thing I ever did. Because they had to bring me back to that house that evening. We got a nice dinner and so forth. But I had champagne, but I, my stomach was not set for something like this. And what happened is that uh, on the way back, there was an air raid by the 8th Air Force and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, no, the British were bombing the Reims uh, uh, National Guards. And now Polo was going. Uh, driving me back home, and, he, and this is after curfew. The German stopped him, and he talked his way out of it. And with him was a, a rustler, they, the, the fellow, they just called him the rustler, a real rugged guy, and he was like a bodyguard to me when I went back. So they brought me back, and I got so sick. I was so sick the next day because of the champagne. And I kept getting thirsty and thirsty, and drinking water and water. So finally they had to send a nurse up to me and they gave me a, she came in to give me a shot. But what they do, they didn't have needles like we do. They had a needle about this big that they come in and hit you with that needle and then take another needle, put the, put the fluid in it and slide it through the opening of this. Now they didn't have the equipment to do these things. They slide it. In the meantime, you got this damn needle stuck in your fanny. You know? She had to do that three days in a row. And every time I say to her, you know, put the, put the fluid into the, the, the needle that you're going to shoot me with, then stick this thing in. Don't stick it in first and keep it in there while you're loading it up. She says, you, you baby, she goes. <laughs> I said, well, you come over here, let me do it to you. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, about, the, about the, the second day, I was getting worse. They sent up a another nurse, and she comes up, and she said, what are you doing, drinking water? I said, yes. She said, I'm thirsty all the time. She said, don't drink water for 24 hours and you'll be all right. For some reason or other, if you have too much champagne, and you continue to drink water, it's like drinking champagne, it gurgles in you, <laughs> you, you feel sick. So I did that, and I felt better the third day. Did you drink champagne to this day? Did I love champagne. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love French champagne. You can't beat it. But uh, <clears throat> I won't drink water with it afterwards. <laughs> but anyway, the, the Pierre came up and he took me to his place in a little town called Chaumes de France, which is uh, oh, probably 10, 15 kilometers away from Reims. And <clears throat> he, um, he, had a, he was a baker and he was a prisoner of war of the Germans. He was a, a second lieutenant and he was captured when, the, uh, when Germans uh, invaded France and they had him as a prisoner of war, but he escaped and came back to Little Town Shaman Maisie and opened up a bakery. But they found out that he was a former prisoner of war and an escape, but they let him operate because they, they all wanted his bread. He used to make some great bread. So he more or less brought me back to health. And he kept me there for 30 days. And uh, 
by the end of the 30 days, I, I, was, I was feeling much better. Had, had, had this whole period of time, had you come across any other Americans? Uh, no other Americans. Mm -hmm. no, about, I did, eventually. Yeah. What happened is that the, the French could never keep quiet. They would uh, brag, and he bragged to a, a priest. He said, I got a, an American I'll take care of. And that was the worst mistake he made. But by, prior to that, <coughs> he and I were trying, he was, they were trying to fly me out of, of France. The uh, British would come in with a, uh, with a plane and drop ammunition and, they, and guns and so forth to these people. And finally they had me going with them uh, because they were hoping that the plane would land. And if it did, they'd put me on a plane and fly me back. They had what they call a Lysander. It was, it was like a small, like a Piper Cub maybe a little bigger. But uh, we, three times we would have gone out to get the, the, the equipment because Pierre had dug, the, and underneath his chick coop, he had dug a hole that was probably eight by 10, and it was loaded with all kinds of ammunition waiting for the invasion to come back. That's where they were gonna come to that sector to get all the ammunition and guns they needed. So we would load that, that, that that place up with more ammunition every time, they, but nobody ever landed to pick me up. So anyway, the one day uh, he came to the house and he said, there's an American airplane that landed. And he, I, I, he said, I'd like to know what to do with it because it's intact. I said, uh, well, could you draw a picture of it? He drew a picture of a P-51. And that was the latest plane we had. Prior to that, all we had was a B, uh, P-47s and P-38s, but they could not fly long distance. They would come into as far as France and they have to go back and we'd have to fly in all alone. The bombers would fly in all alone. That's why we would get knocked out. Yeah. So what happened, the P-51 could fly longer and uh, could go all the way into Berlin and back. And um, it was a P-51. He took me down and he showed it to me from a distance and he befriended the, the, the uh, German officer of a soldier that was guarding it. And uh, he came back home, he says, uh, I said, what are you doing? He says, he was setting up a bomb, time bomb, to blow it up, which he did. He took it in, he befriended the guy, put it under the seat, and the plane blew up. Uh, I, I said, what happened to the soldier? Kaput, that means he's dead. So there was no love lost between that group and the Germans. They, they, they lost a hell of a lot. But when he made the mistake by telling uh, this uh, priest who I was, there was a $10,000 reward that somebody could get if they turned into an American. And they had, <coughs> they had articles in the paper, and they'd say, we'll give you $10,000 if, if you turn into an American, a British uh, pilot, and uh, if you do, if you hide about the husband's going to be shot, and the wife's going to go to, to a concentration camp. Well, the next day, after he told the priest I was supposed to leave and go to a, another safe house, because you're not supposed to be in a safe house too long, he helped 28 flyers, British and American. I'm the only one that stayed 30 days with him, and because of my condition. The others would stay one or two days, and off they'd go. <coughs> so the next day, and ready to take off, uh, who comes by, the Gestapo picks us up. Yeah. He wasn't there, but they got his wife and me, and off we go to Gestapo headquarters in, in, uh, in Reims. Apparently the priest gave me away. Well, anyway, uh, I'm in there for, I wasn't there too long, maybe one or two days, and they were questioning her, boy, they were torturing her. And they, they didn't get to me yet, but they had tortured her quite a bit. Well, it was a shame. And uh, they were supposed to transfer me to another sector. But the chief of police of Reims was, a, was with the French underground. And he knew of me. And he was supposed to be the one that's going to transport me. So they get me in, into the, the, the chief's car. They have a uniform in there as the, the assistant chief of police. They, they shoved the, the, the hat on me, they put the drape, drape, drape the jacket around me, and here I am with the, my arm in a cast, though, 
right through all the the Germans and off we go to another farmhouse. My God, I said, well, I can't believe that this is happening, you know. But that's how we got out the second time. So I mean, they took us to another farmhouse, and that's where I met a British. And there was a British there by the name of uh, I can't remember his name now, but uh, he was there already before I was. And there was a fellow named Bronos, B-R-A-U-N-I-C-E, and his wife, and he had one child. And uh, <clears throat> he said to me, uh, he, I want to show you something. He showed us two walls. One was full of water, and the other one was empty. He said, they're going to come looking for you. When they come looking for you, he spoke broken English. When they come, I could see them from a distance, because they had to go about 200 yards to his house on the street. And you could see the street out there. The two of you go down the well, and I'll cover it. And sure enough, the next day they, they came there, and we're down that well for about 20 minutes or half an hour, and they're sitting above us talking in French, and we didn't know what was going on. We were waiting for them to open up and find us in there, but they never did. And finally they left, and out we came out of that well. And to this day, I'm, <laughs> I'm claustrophobic, you know. <laughs> so the, uh, we stayed there a couple of days, and it was, he took us around and showed us uh, World War I trenches and World War II trenches. The, there was a battlefield right where his farm was, you know, World War I and also World War II. My God, you could find all kinds of helmets and guns and anything you wanted to find, it was right there. What was I going to do with them? But there was hundreds of them right in that. And apparently, they, the soldiers just left them there, and, and he, he didn't care about it. He just left them in the Rock. So we were there two or three days, and they took us to a, a little town called Bulgoin. And we stayed there. We were supposed to stay there a couple of days. And I had lost my dog tags. I didn't know where my dog tags were. And we got into the, the uh, restaurant and they had a bath. And this fellow called me into the bath, he's the owner of the restaurant, he says, and on top of his mirror, he had one of my dog tags. So I thought that the Gestapo would take both of my dog tags, but apparently the French had taken one, and they left the other. The Gestapo had already taken one. They left, uh, when, they, when the Gestapo got me, they got one. And when the French people got a hold of me, they took the other one. But without a dog tag, you're in trouble over there. Right. You know? Well, even uh, let me, if I'm correct, if, if you're out of uniform and you're captured, you're considered a spy and can, by Geneva Convention, can be shot. Correct? That's right. Yeah. That's right. But at least if you had your dog tag, you might be able to talk your way out of it. You know. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I would tell them who I was because they knew who I was. And, I mean, I've been around there so long. They, they knew everything about me, and they, they wondered who, where the hell I was, you know, they couldn't find me. <laughs> and I had all these helpers. <laughs> you had to be lucky. You had to be lucky, but you had to be smart and listen to your, your helpers. You, you couldn't, you had to do absolutely what they said. If you trusted them, you did exactly what they said, and that's what helped you. And we were pretty well trained about that beforehand. I can give examples of that later on. The, uh, what had happened is that uh, I, I tried to get my dog tag back and he wouldn't give it to me. I said, you know, I kept telling him I need that dog tag. And uh, I only stayed there two days and they had to get me out of there because it was getting too hot. And they brought me to Mrs. Ramoget's house without my dog tag. I had my first bath from landing. Prior to that, I got a little sponge bath in it. She took me and put me in the bath. <laughs> I must have smelled something awful. <laughs> because she she gave me a bath, by God, that damn thing was black. <laughs> well, anyway, the next day they took me and they said, uh, you're going you're gonna to leave. You're going to Epony. So I ended up in Epony. When I got to Epony, France, I said my goodbyes to everybody. Well, before that, they brought me to a to the champagne factory where one of the uh, one of the French boys that uh, brought that big champagne at that party, they brought me to a champagne factory. And well, while we were in there, the Germans were walking in and out of the place and, and uh, 
the Americans come over and they got a bomb the marshalling house again. And his champagne factory was right next to the marshalling house. And they took us and put us down in his dungeon. There must have been millions of bottles of champagne. And the bombs are falling and the balls are rattling away. <laughs> and by this time I'm all alone, maybe hundreds and hundreds of feet on the ground. You have to take an elevator to get out. But when you walk down, it's a hell of a lot of walk. A lot, a lot of walk. But now I'm down here with about a 15 watt bulb and rats running around. And, oh my God, it was horrible, but it was a good hiding place. Well, when the, when that was over, with about three or four hours later, they came up and got me, and that's when I went to the Ron Mayshay house. What happened when the Americans landed there one day, was a fellow from Haverhill. His name was DeFazio. He went through, through that uh, champagne factory. And uh, the owner said, uh, does anybody come from Haverhill, Massachusetts? He says, I do. He says, I want you to take this bottle to John, and there's one for you. <laughs> he gave him a, gave him a bottle of champagne, and he brought it all the way back from France. <laughs> he, became a, he became a mailman here in Haverhill, we were good friends for a long time. But he did bring the bottle of champagne all the way back from France. <laughs> well, anyway, the, uh, he got me down to Epony, France, and on my way to Paris. So, we didn't stay in Epony long. We went from Epony or from Reims to Epony to Paris. And when I got to Paris, they um, they brought me to a gendarme's house, and uh, because the the Germans now what were they were doing? They were calling a a roust. A roust was that they would block off a whole square, and they would check every house and look for the Jewish people. They look for young people. If they find anywhere, they put them on the trucks and off they go to labor camps. And uh, with me being 20 years old, I'd be the first one picked up. So they dressed me up as a gendarme. See a picture up there of the gendarme? That's me, 20 years old, walking up in the champs Elysees for two days. That was the route that he had. I'd go up and down. When the Germans asked me questions all the time, I'd go make believe I was a boss and let this guy do the answering. <laughs> so after two days of that, they, that's when I joined up with about six other Americans. They, those are the, the six that I was supposed to climb the Pyrenees Mountains with. Well, they brought us to this uh, electric company office and they, uh, they told us that the next day that we're going to leave uh, Paris and these are the fellows that are going to lead the way out. You follow them, they're going to have the tickets. They're going to give you the tickets just before you board the train, and we're going to take you down to Toulouse. Well, we got to the train station the next day, and the, the two people that we were following all of a sudden disappeared. I was left with a fellow by the name of Jack Stead from, he was from Detroit, Dearborn, Michigan, actually. And uh, they paired us up, had paired us up. There were six of us. Uh, so each one was paired up with another one of the, of the, of the six. The British fellow was still with us, but he was paired up with a, with a Frenchman who happened to be a spy and was going back to report things back to England, you know. And he apparently kept doing this quite often. Now, what happened is Jack Stead was a, much older than me, maybe three, you know, three or four years older than, than you know, being 23, 24 years old. It's a big difference than being 20. When you're 20, you're like a boy scout. You say you can get through with anything, but when you're 23, you just worry about it because you're married and you've got kids. But he was married and had, had a daughter. And uh, he said, gee, what are we going to do? I said, first, thing, just keep quiet. He said, here he is. He's got a, a pair of army boots that were painted black. I wish I had army boots on me, but I had a pair of shoes that were one and a half sizes too small for me, just dress shoes. <clears throat> but I, we were both dressed up in uh, French uniforms, and I mean French civilian uniforms. And uh, this went on for about a half an hour, so we went into a kiosk and made a believe we were going to buy a magazine or something. And we kept looking over it because the Gestapo was all over the place. You could always spot them because they always had leather coats on for some strange reason. And uh, <clears throat> finally some fellow came by and he said to us, follow me. So I looked at Jack, he looked at me, and we didn't know whether we should follow him or not. So he got angry and came back again. He said, follow me. So he said, what are we going to do? We've got to follow him. If he, if he wanted to capture us, he could have done it anyway, right? So we followed him. 
He was, he was a replacement uh, uh, helper. The other two that were supposed to follow got captured. And we didn't know that. But he was a replacement. And uh, he was a follow-up guy. And uh, gave us the tickets and we went, and we went to Tulu. Get on that plane, the train. It was jammed with people. Jammed. Couldn't find a seat. I had several hours to go to Tulu. And I was exhausted. The uh, Jack happened to find a seat. And of course we couldn't communicate with one another. We had, uh, prior to going, leaving Paris, they took us to a, uh, a photographer. She was a Jewish woman and she had a Star of David on her. It was the first time I had seen it and she told me all about what was happening. And when you get back to England, would you please tell them what's happened to the, German, the, 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 the Jewish people and this and that. She explained the whole thing to us. And uh, they looked at our, our uh, identification papers that we had got out in Reims, and they said, these are no good. If you show them to anybody, then they're going to capture you right away. And we had pictures taken in Reims. I, I kept the picture of that, but they took my identification papers away and gave them newest, newest, and not with a new picture. So we, we kept them on us, but nobody questioned us. However, a woman got up, and apparently she had to go to a bathroom, so I sat, quickly sat down in the chair. She came back. I was supposed to be deaf and dumb, so that I had to play the part of the deaf and dumb guy. She comes back, and she's talking to me in French about her seat and this and that. I'm sitting there, blah, 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 not saying a word, you know, <laughs> making her believe I'm deaf and dumb. Jack Stead got up, and he said, uh, he spoke a little French, Madame blah, 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 you take my seat, she sat down. So that helped. <laughs> so I sat down the rest of the way. Now we got no food to eat or anything, but everybody in that train had had sandwiches they then brought along because they wouldn't give you any. But finally we got into Toulouse and they put us up for one night and uh, they said, you're going to climb the Pyrenees Mountains. The first time I realized that definitely we were going to climb the mountains. They told us that this might happen, but they also told us that we might fly out or we might go towards the English Channel and, and be taken back by gunboat. The gunboats used to come in, pick about 27 people, put them in, stack them up on a gunboat and they take them back to England. And uh, I thought that might happen to us, but it, it didn't. And uh, we we're heading down to Peru and I said, definitely we're going to, we're going to climb the Pyrenees. Now, here I am just a several weeks after, I don't know, a couple of months after being all shot up, trying to recover. I'm supposed to climb the Pyrenees with a pair of shoes that's a size and a half too small for me. So she, this woman says to me, her name was Genevieve. She was very famous. She was a very famous uh, helper. She, she got all kinds of awards uh, from the American government, the British government, the crowded day, you name it. This woman, she, she was tough. Nice young woman, not, not too old, she was probably in the 30s, but she ran that whole operation and uh, they called it the Burgundy Line. And I was to be uh, the code name Burgundy. I'm writing a book one of these days, and that's what's going to be named, Code Burgundy. And uh, uh, what would happen is uh, they had different lines that you'd go through to climb the Pyrenees. And this line was called Burgundy, there's another line called something else. To this day, people try to climb what we did, and they can't make it. But anyway, I said to her, I, said, I need a pair of shoes. If I'm going to climb the mountains, I can't climb the shoes. They couldn't find a pair of shoes that fit me. I had a size uh, 10 and a half, and that was a size 9. That's all they could right? So I couldn't complain. You know what I mean? But what they gave us was uh, the same jacket. It was, a, it was just a dress jacket with a light sweater. No gloves. No hat, you know. This is climbing mountains with, tr with snow and so forth. <laughs> and uh, this is what we climbed the mountains with. What, what were what, what were weather conditions like when you were the days well, you climbed? Well, fortunately, climbing. that we didn't have uh, much rain uh, and no snow, but there was snow on the ground. <laughs> but what happened the, the next day? They took us down by train to uh, the foothills of the mountains. They said that. Uh, a guide was going to come by and take us up. And by this time, there was 
three Jewish, three Jewish fellows, I forget how many, no, six Jewish, six Americans, one British and one Frenchman. And <clears throat> there was a total of 17 of us by this time. That's a big group. And we were waiting at the foothills of the mountains, and the guy never showed up. Now we were there for, for several hours, and all of a sudden all hell broke loose. And spotlights shining up where we were, and, and uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, no, the guy finally came, sorry, finally came about 12, 14, 15 hours late. And he thought we were going to go to a different section, and they had him in the wrong place. And he had they, when he went there, they found out he had to be here, so he was late in coming. When he came, we started climbing along the valleys of the mountains, which was the easiest way to go into Spain. However, what happened? We were spotted. Dogs got the outset, they're barking. The Germans had spotlights trying to spot us, and. Our guy told us just, just fall down and sit there, which we did. This went on for about a half an hour. All of a sudden, the lights went out, the dogs were gone and left. So we asked the guy, what happened? He said they thought that you, the whole group was a bunch of French uh, marquis, they called them, uh, loaded with guns and so forth. They don't want to get in a firefight. So we lucked out in that respect. But now we had to start climbing the mountains. We couldn't stay in a valley. So right away he had us going up the mountains. We climbed five days and five nights. And every day during the day they had spotter planes trying to find us. But we, we could hear them coming so we duck. About the, the fourth day, the fourth night, we, uh, we found a barn. And Jesus was getting the barn and Jesus, nothing but lice in there. So we were all scratching. <laughs> we were so tired we all fell asleep. <laughs> we were exhausted. I don't know how the heck we ever made the mountains. The only way I got over was two fellows helping. There's Jack's dead, and one other fella pulled me over. They got a stick. Mind you, they had just taken off my my cast and my arm. I couldn't use this right arm at all. And they were pulling me up the mountains with a stick. And you, you had your ribs healed by this point? Huh? Had your ribs and your ankle healed by this point? I, they had. They had. Uh, they couldn't couldn't do it any with broken ribs yeah. except to put a sheet around me. That's all they did. They recovered somewhat. Because I didn't have the because that had to be painful being uh, pulled. When you have to, when you want to escape, yeah. you do whatever you can to yeah. help. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't feel the pain. Mm. Put it off your mind. Mm -hmm. You want to get out. You want freedom. You know what freedom is? When you're tied in with people like this, but even one day and you lose your freedom for one day. You know what that's like? Well, let's say one year and one day it is tough. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. You have no yeah. control. No. Nobody there to help you out. You, you do whatever you can to get out, especially if you're young. Well, yeah. during that whole, I guess to back back up and, and along these, this thought, this this whole period of time, was there any any times that you'd given up hope? It, it, never give up hope. No. Never, no, never give up hope. I had never given up hope, and none of the people I that I got up with, like the, uh, Jack Hood was that Englishman. That's his name. Even he didn't give up hope. None of us gave up hope. We, but, we uh, knew, we, for some reason or another, we knew we were going to make it. I mean, even, but backtracking from the time that you'd been shot down, I mean, even in the worst, when you were in, laying there uh, almost near death, and, and did, is there any point in time it's like... At that point, when I was in my deathbed for that whole week, I thought, I, I never thought that uh, I'd live that long. I kept fighting it, but I never thought I'd ever make it that long, yeah. especially when I was getting no treatment. Yeah. But you, you just... You bear with it, and you hope you you do make it. But yeah. uh, uh, I, I never gave up, you know, because I I pass out, and I would probably fall asleep or pass out, and then come to when I come to, I say, "Geez, I'm still here," you know. And say, so "Maybe maybe something can happen," you know. But I figured the Germans eventually were going to take me and put me in a hospital, and uh, take care of me in that respect. But their form of torture sometimes is not not taking your uh, and your fingernails out, like they did, did a lot of people, your eyeballs out, and their farmer talks to you, well, this guy's ready for the deathbed anyway, we don't have to do anything, maybe he's going to give us some information that we can use. 
I was 20 years old. That, yeah. What did I know? I didn't know I, yeah. what, what was going on. All, yeah. all I knew was a gunner, I was a photographer, and, and uh, that, that was it. But whatever they could get out of you would, would help them. Yeah. And uh, they did this to a lot of people. And uh, he, uh, what they would do with prisoners, they would take them and put them in solitary confinement for a long time because you, you, you lose your freedom the minute they grab you. You yeah. lose that freedom. And they figure the minute you lose your freedom, then uh, you're going to give them the information they want. But we were, we were at school to, to give them name, rank, serial number, and that's it. That's, what I, they, that's all I gave them, and I told them not to bother me anymore. But never gave up hope. Okay. And I don't know anybody that I climbed the Pyrenees with that ever gave up hope. But what I did do one time, it was about the third day, and I was holding the people back. We had no food. They, they didn't supply us with food because they thought we were going to go through the valleys. They thought we were going to make it in a day or two. Well, the guy had food, but he wasn't going to give you any of his food. Well, I said to them, look, by this time I'm eating leaves and whatever I could find. And the water, you go into a stream, you don't know if it's any polluted or what. You, 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 or you took snow and you, you, you took the snow in your mouth and kept it in your mouth and so you wouldn't dehydrate. But um, all of a sudden one, one of the fellows turned around and says, Jimmy, I've got something to give you. And he had two cubes of sugar. And apparently he had a, somebody had given him a pound of sugar and he gave me two cubes. He said, now don't chew them, just let them melt in your mouth. Those two cubes of sugar, believe me, gave me so much strength, it was unbelievable. Because I had just before that, I told them, give me a, give me a, uh, we used to have a, a small compass. And uh, my compass was taken, uh, the Germans confiscated everything I had, the maps and so forth, the money I had, so it was confiscated. I didn't have a dime on me all this time. <clears throat> so I said, leave me with a compass and I'll find my way across. I'll take it easy. If you could leave me with just something a little to eat. But they wouldn't do that. That's when they, they, they got a hold of a stick and stopped pulling me over the mouths, which they did for two days. Finally, we got up the, uh, we got to an area where there was a stone. It was the fifth day. And on the stone, it said France, Spain. And the, 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 uh, it was a, the guide was a Basque. You've heard of Basque yeah. guys. And he must have been a, uh, Prior to World War uh, II, he must have been a, a somebody going back and forth with contraband of some kind. But the American government apparently was paying these fellows like ten thousand dollars for each American they got over. That's what I heard anyway, and they were willing to take that chance. What happened is that uh, he said, uh, "Okay, now Spain is there," and, we'll, and everybody started talking loud. He said, "But don't talk, because even if you're in Spain." Gestapo's here, they could pick you up and still take you to prison. Because so that was a that, fascist country as well. That, Spain was a fascist country still as was, well. Yeah. yeah. So finally we just shut down and three or four hours later we, we climbed down into a, a little town called Les Spain, L-E-S. And they were waiting for us. <laughs> they knew we were up there probably. <laughs> so they came over and they, they uh, were in this little town for a uh, and they, I couldn't believe it. We went, we went around town. They let us free for a while, gave us something to eat, and then they took us uh, to the town. They let us move around. Here is a country that was so poor, but you go in the churches. They had gold leaf, gold domes, and so forth. And the people are starving. You know, I couldn't believe it. The uh, they put us in a truck and took us to a town named Lerma, and on the way over. You'd go over these bridges that had been bombed out to the Civil War, mm -hmm. and all they did was put planks on them. You know, they never repaired them. They didn't have the money to repair them. So they got us, got us into Lourdes, and that's where they locked us up. Now, give us a timeline. You know, do you know the date you arrived in Spain? Do you have a, a rough date time? Or I could tell you that now, because we were climbing the Pyrenees Mountain on D-Day. I think that was the last day we were in the mountains. But nobody told us when we got to Lourdes, the DD had taken effect. So they locked us up. By this time I was now getting 
I was in bad shape. Uh, the, um, they, the night before, they gave us something to eat, and we all got sick because our, our stomachs couldn't handle the food that we had. A lot of people died that way, and I, in our group, they didn't, none of them did die. But we should have been careful what we ate. We should have eaten in small quantities, but we hadn't eaten in five or six days. So when we ate, it would gobble the food down, and that, that affected us badly. But by the second day, I was in such bad shape. I don't know how many days. We were, we were in prison. I don't know how many days now. And um, taking the, prison. Who were you being held prison by? The Spanish government. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they, they put us in. They lowered us. They lowered a prison. They called it. Uh, we were in there, and uh, they 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 investigated us. And I remember we had to take out. We had. They told us to take out uh, uh, identification papers and rip them up because. I had a different name. My name was Jean Goua. Now here I am, John Casares, Sergeant, U.S. Air Force. If, if they found out I was Jean Goua, they could ship me back to France. But, so I had to take that thing and tear it. We took it up and tore them apart and dug them into the ground. And when we had a little time to walk around, we did that. And I kept a picture, that's all I did. The, uh, what happens? A major, one of the the, the biggest, the lot, uh, the uh, highest ranking officer that climbed the mountains with us was a major. He was a, a P-47 pilot, and uh, his name was Burgess. And he he looked at me and he says, "How you doing, John?" I said, "Not good at all." He said, "We got to take you to a doctor." So he got a hold of the commander of the, of the prison, and he said, "I got a very sick man here. You got to take him to the prison doctor." So they did. But under God, they took him and me to the prison doctor, and he spoke perfect English. And when I walked in, he checked me out, he said, we've got to put you in the hospital. So I'd be willing to go to the hospital and get away from jail, you know. But he says, uh, did you know that the uh, Allies landed in France and they're going to get the shit kicked out of them? I said, jeez, thank you very much, sir. I feel better already. He took care of all my ills. I went out and told Burgess what happened. Jeez, by this time, I was recovering quickly, you know, when I heard that. I said, Jesus, he just told me that the Americans, the Allies landed in, in uh, France, and this and that's going to happen. So I said, maybe you ought to tell the commander you know about it. They give you, they allow you to make a phone call to our uh, embassy. We had an embassy in, in Madrid, but they didn't know what we were there. So. After two days, they allowed him to make a phone call, and he got a hold of the, uh, whether he got a hold of the, the counselor there or the ambassador, I don't know, but they, the, day, the next day they sent a Spanish-speaking, uh, Amer he was a, a, a Spanish uh, employee uh, of the uh, embassy, he spoke Spanish, and he came down, and he got us released. And we, we got into another truck and they took us up and down a mountain and little, these pastures, you know, hanging out of the truck. <laughs> you know, you're up 10,000 feet and your feet are <laughs> dangling over over the mountains. And those mountains were pretty high in per the Pyrenees. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know how high they go, but they were, I'd say 10,000, 12,000 feet high. And the little rows that they have up there, there's only one truck to go by. So they finally got us into a, another town. Uh, I think it was called Saragossa. And there, they, they, they finally gave us a, uh, a room to go in, and they, uh, we took a, got a shower finally, and uh, they uh, fed us a little, slowly, no liquor. And um, that night, they said, okay, everybody pack up, we're gonna take you for new clothes. So now we're taking a shoot, we had taken a, a shower, off, but we had our old clothes. So they brought us into a to a clothing store that they opened up after hours, and we all went in and we, we, we all, uh, uh, got all new underwear, handkerchiefs, uh, shirts, jackets. So they took our old clothes. A proper size pair of shoes. Uh, a right? proper size yeah, pair of shoes. A proper pair of shoes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My feet to this day all crinkled up like that from that climb. Anyway. Uh, they uh, kept us there for a day. It was a very nice town. I liked the town. And the next day they took us to Madrid. And it was a Sunday. And there was a bullfight going on. And we saw 
Frankel drive by, and he was going to the bullfights. We were trying to get permission to attend the bullfights. They wouldn't let us go. And uh, the next day, they took us on a by train and brought us down to Gibraltar. Gibraltar was controlled by the, the English. And they, they took our civilian clothes away when they gave us British clothes. And uh, the day or two later, they flew us back from Gibraltar to uh, Bristol, England. And uh, while we were in Gibraltar, the, uh, they told us, why don't you buy some watches? These fellows sell watches. And uh, because when you get to England, they don't have watches. You can make a fortune on them. Well, they were selling these uh, Omega watches, right? And uh, I didn't know what Omega watch for another watch, so I, uh, I couldn't, I didn't have any, enough money to buy an Omega watch. But I did buy about three or four watches. I can't, I can't remember the names of them. And I put them on my wrist. When I got, we got the, the uh, when we got the Bristol, even right away they grabbed our hands. They knew that we might have watches on. And I, I made myself a little profit out of it. <laughs> but from there they took us to London. And when I got to London, and that six of us were being interrogated by intelligence for two days. And uh, I told them everything I knew, where ammunition dumps were, or how the Germans were treating the Jewish people, and how they were doing about drugs, and how they are taking people and sending them to concentration camps, and how they torture people. I gave them the whole story, you know. And, uh, but they have to verify the EIU. So they had the six of us lined up, and they said, Who's Burgundy? So I stood up. Now the youngest guy had a whole group. You're Burgundy? <laughs> now they only knew what happened to Burgundy. They didn't know who Burgundy was from Reims and all this. Everything that was transpired, they had a good idea what was going on. They wanted to know who Burgundy was because I went through the Burgundy line and they couldn't believe it was me. So they had them verified that it was me. So they said, well, who do you know in your rear base? So, I said, I know the intelligence officer, Pop Fry. So they flew him down, he was a major, they flew him down, and he came in right away and says, hey John, how are you? <laughs> so he knew who I was, but they didn't know, they don't believe what you said, but now you have to sign a statement to the effect that everything that you went through, you can't reveal it to anybody. My mother, my father, my sisters, my two brothers died, never knew the story I'm telling you. Is that right? Because they never, have never released us from this. Uh, this, uh, I, ha I still have that form that I signed, a secrecy form. Well, I finally uh, proved that I was John Casares and Burgundy, and uh, still 20 years old. <laughs> and uh, they got us back up to my base. When I got to my base, I met my the colonel of the base. His name was Colonel Bowman. And uh, he, uh, they were so busy with the invasion that he, was he had to go to headquarters in, in uh, Paris and he was being transferred. So I didn't have a chance to stay with him long, except he asked me one question, would you be willing to go to different areas, so uh, bomber bases, and, and talk to them about the evading and escaping, which I did. But after he left, uh, this colonel walked in, and geez, I gave me a hard time. He didn't believe the story that I said about how the airplane uh, was almost hit by another airplane. We fought, we bombed the Frankfurt, we came right back, we all, the plane we shot down over the Reams. He never believed the story. And my intelligence officer, and he almost got into, into a scrape. And as a result, I never stayed to get my distinguished flying cross because of him. I went to the other bases and spoke uh, about the baiting and escaping. And uh, when I got through there, they sent me back to London. And I was in headquarters in London. And the odd part about it here is this colonel of my base giving me a hard time. Yet, the General Williams, who was head of our whole division, the first division, he was the head man in that whole division. He's the guy that made the decision where you bombed. <clears throat> he befriended me, gave me a, a pass. He said to me, you don't have to salute anybody because you got a bad heart. They should be saluting you, he said. And he gave me a pass. I could go anywhere in England I wanted to. And uh, 
He said, when you want to go home, you just come see me. Uh, they had me right in headquarters where Eisenhower was, where, where uh, Williams was, where Doolittle was, where Patton was. All these guys were there, you know. And I'm, I'm in the next door to them. And uh, Did you get the chance to meet any of these Oh, people? yeah. Is yeah. that right? But you know, they're 20 years old, but it didn't mean anything yeah. at that time. You yeah. know, I should have asked them for the autographs, you know, <laughs> but I never did. And, you know, they're busy people, and, yeah. and uh, any time I wanted the, uh, an auto to go someplace, uh, they, they made the, they had a whack, uh, a, a, a British girl drive me. I had Eisenhower's uh, personal driver, who they claimed was his girlfriend. Yeah. Um, she drove me a couple of times around London. A very nice person. And, uh, but the V1 bomb started to come over when I was there. I had been bombed in London before. While we were there, every time we went to London, the, the German bombers would come over and bomb. We used to hide down at the, into the uh, underground and so forth. But one of these days we, we said, uh, geez, what, if, what if the entrance to the underground is uh, blocked off and we're stuck in here. From that time on, we used to stay, sit in a pub and drink beer while they're bombing London. Churchill would be going by helping the firefighters over there. You know, it's so interesting to meet all these people, see all these people at the time, you know, that you hear about now. And we thought nothing of it. You, you go and help the firefighters and Churchill will be there doing the same thing. And he, he was an amazing guy, that guy. And uh, so when uh, the V1 bomb started to come by, you could see them flying. And a, the British had so, so much guts to knock them down. They used to fly above them and come and shoot them down. And that, that there was nothing but a bomb. And they'd blow it up. And the, their plane would go right through that explosion. And many of them got killed that way. But the, uh, it, was, it, was, it was weird because what would happen, you'd hear the buzz bar coming over and go pop, 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 pop. You, could, you could hear it and then you could see it. Then all of a sudden, when you start making that pop, pop, pop noise, you knew that it was going to, then you count to ten. If you counted to ten, you were alive. But if you counted to one, that was hit next to you. But they knew that the V-2 bomb was going to come, come into play. The V-2 bomb was flying up so high, nobody could knock it down, and it'd come down. Uh, and about a lot, thousands of people got killed in London during that time. And uh, General Williams one day came up to me and says, it's time for you to go home, John. So he gave me a ticket to go on a plane, uh, a train, overnight train, first class to Scotland. From well, Scotland, he put me on, on uh, they put me on, uh, on uh, President Roosevelt had a plane. He was a, called a Connie. Actually, they use it all the time, but he, that's the plane he used to fly in. They put me on that plane with all the high VIPs that were flying back to America. They went to Iceland, from Iceland. I landed up in, uh, in New York. They put me in a hospital overnight. And I got more treatment from the French medical treatment than I did the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> and what happened is that uh, my folks had not received any notification that I was alive. They had received notice that I was missing in action. And I had, when I got back to England, I sent them a telegram. They hadn't received it. So when I telephoned from New York, they, they, they were surprised. A day later, they received my telegram. Huh. So I left the, my, my kid brothers out in New York, and, and my relatives were there, and they sent me to Havel. I got into Havel. And it was at night time, and I was the only one on the, in one of the cars coming from Boston. <clears throat> and there was a fellow named uh, Jack George, who was the assistant principal of the high school at the time. And he was a, he was a naval officer. And he had, knew, he had known that I was uh, missing in action. And it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a kind, of, kind of a spit and rain, and it was foggy. I got off the train. And he's coming up another direction, and he almost fainted. <laughs> he saw me coming out of the, the fog. fog. <laughs> he said, "Is that you, John?" 
And to this day, 90 some odd years old, he talks about that. He said, I almost died when I saw you. <laughs> so I came home and uh, uh, they had a good, uh, good party for, set up on me and then they sent me back to Waltham Regional Hospital and they, they uh, took a few pieces of shrapnel out of me there and uh, they decided to send me to recruiting. So I recruited up until uh, I got home in uh, uh, July. Actually, I landed in Haverhill on my birthday, July 6th. All right, on my birthday. Yeah. And they, they had me a recruiting uh, Air Force men. Uh, and I did that for a period of uh, two or three months. And uh, <clears throat> they put me back in the hospital again and they finally decided to discharge me. So I had heard about the GI Bill of Rights, so I applied for Boston University and they, I went to BU for four years and graduated and became a I went, I went for uh, advertising purposes, but in those days you had no TV and uh, FM radio hadn't even come out, so it was pretty hard getting that type of a job. And I went to work for uh, 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 beneficial finance and uh, I opened up my own offices uh, and uh, sold them. And then I finally opened up another one in Havel. I ran the Havel Finance for a while, got involved with the bank. And, at the bank and the financing and, and then real estate. And I ended up my life in real estate after I sold my finance company. So that's my story. Fascinating. How did, uh, did you fully recuperate then from your injuries or did you? Uh, I never fully re recuperate. Yeah. My back, I still have problems with my back, my legs, my feet. Uh, I've got the stenosis of the spine and uh, uh, my neck is, I have a lot of problems with it, but you know, the funniest thing happened, being 20 years old and uh, going through all this, the doctors in Boston just before discharge me said, your father has to come in here and listen to the discharge. So they had my record there with my father there, and they knew that I played sports, you know. So they said to my father, you know, he's got pro this problem, that problem with his legs, his back, and this, and, but uh, if he continues to play sports, he might live another 20 years. <laughs> I outlived him by 40 some odd years. <laughs> and, uh, so my father was very influential in that respect and he, he was very helpful to me and I had a good family. Well, for, for, okay, we talked physically, psychologically, how, how were you? Uh, every, every, uh, XPOW and escapee and has uh, PTSD and uh, post-traumatic stress right, syndrome. Right. Right. I have it. Yeah, you have to admit to that fact. What happens is that now you can't you can't be cooped up. Uh, if you get cooped up in a room, you can get uh, anxiety uh, to the to the point where the person can have a heart attack and die. Uh, elevators, uh, I bought some height now. I skied for a long time, but as, as it, the time went by, uh, the height, it just looked down. The skiing didn't bother me, but just looking down from heights. I uh, go into a, uh, a hotel, not more than three stories high. Uh, walk instead of taking elevators. Don't get cooped up in an elevator. Uh, that it affects all of us. Everybody uh, is in the same situation. And, and, and I, go, I go to these XPOW meetings, one in Lowell every other week, every other Tuesday, and I go to one in, in uh, Boston uh, every Thursday, and we help one another out. And uh, every one of us has got PTSD. And, and at that time, the, uh, the Army wasn't equipped to treat you, I mean, like yeah. they are today, no? You just, you were released and That's you're on it. your own, right? That's it. You're I didn't get any treatment at all, nothing, nothing. Uh, it's just recently that they've, they've brought up, and, and it's what happened, it's happened because the key to that whole thing is that the right of Iraq war, when that girl got captured, and <coughs> she got captured, and she went through, well, a lot of us went through, mm -hmm. she got back, 
they realize at that point there's something to this. And why are these prisoners of wars, you know, now as they got older, uh, having this reaction? When we came back, well, we, we had to try to get to school, to learn something, get a job, bring up a family. Just, and this, you know, you're trying to keep this out of your mind, but it's always in the back of your mind. Yeah. You know? And now you can't tell anybody about this thing. So you had, you've held it inside of you all these years. So what they did is they gave her 100% disability. Well, why would they give her 100% disability and not the POWs and escapees from World War uh, II? And they realized at that time there's something to this, and they sent us all in for physical examinations and try to help out in that respect. <clears throat> I go in with a captain, Joe Lavoy, who wrote a book about this. I got a book here. And he has got PTSD uh, worse than I've got it. I try to help him out. But he, at the same time, he's helping me out. By my helping him out, he's helping me out. Yeah. But he, if you talk to him about, if anybody brings up the Iraq war, flies right off the handle. And I try to settle them down. And this happens to a lot of people. So you can't go into a meeting and talk in favor of the Iraq war or against it because each person has his, yeah. own, his yeah. own thoughts what happened to yeah. him when he was a prisoner. To this day, the American government doesn't recognize escapees or evades. We have a APES, Amer American Air Forces Escape and Evasion Society, and we're dwindling away. And to this day, they haven't even recognized us. They finally recognized XPOWs about 10 years ago when they gave them the POW medal. But that was only until 10 years ago. But the, eight, the escapees, anybody that escaped, or evaded like I did, they have no, no don't, even want, don't even want to know about it. The English yet, and the, and, and the uh, Canadians, they recognize them. But this government, for some reason, rather doesn't. Yeah, yeah, any idea why? Why that? Yeah, they write to the association, writes to the congressmen, and so forth. They got more important things to do than worry about a handful of people like us, you know. But it's a, it's a shame because you got, you got wars going on all the time. A lot of people escape. And, you know, we we bring them into our association from uh, from Vietnam War and from the uh, Korean War. We bring them in. And uh, we got people in, in uh, Boston, uh, two or three that went to Korea, and one from Vietnam, and Lowell, the same thing. Some of them are in very bad condition. I had a fellow in Lowell, and he we get in a meeting, and the thing to do is try to talk to one another and let them know how you feel, and not necessarily how you, what you went through, because they know what you went through. But this fellow never even spoke. For three months, never said a word. And one day, uh, when we left, you know, I was thinking about why he doesn't speak, you know. I asked the director. He said he never spoke. So who came to pick him up was his wife. And she brought a wheelchair so he, because he has to ride in a wheelchair. And so I met her, and she says, gee, you, you got a Greek name. You Greek? I said, yeah. I am. She said, I'm Greek too. That's my husband. I said, that's your husband? I said, does he know anything in Greek? She says, oh yeah, he knows a little bit of Greek because we always went to Athens. He was stationed in Saudi Arabia. He was an engineer there. So I said, tell him to say something in Greek. So she said, hey honey, say something to me in Greek. And he says, Sagapor. That means I love you in Greek. That's the first words he ever said. I said, next week, when your husband comes back, yeah. I want him to get in front of the group and tell them what happened to him. Well, we went into the meeting the following week, 15 minutes after the meeting, he hadn't said a word, so I said, okay, Walter, it's your, time to t your turn to tell us what's going on. He never stopped speaking for half an hour. <laughs> These are the things that you can do yeah. with people, yeah. and it helps them. But the guy held it inside him all these years. And now we get to the meeting, at least once in a while, they pop up and say something. And this happens to a lot of people. Uh, have you had a chance uh, uh, since 
the war to, to travel back to the places you were, meet some of the, the resistant people I, that helped you? If, uh, I went back with my um, uh, four, three members of my crew. And, uh, we yeah, were, and if you could explain too, eventually what uh, what happened to the rest of your crew, real quickly after your your story here. All right, the uh, what happened to the crew is that the, the pilot and co-pilot were released from prison. The uh, <coughs> ball turret operator and the radio man had to walk about 500 miles to get out. The Walter Rush, who was my uh, my ball turret man, uh, believe it or not, was very interesting. He he. Uh, his family was told that he was killed in action. And uh, when he got back home, he's the only man that was in prison at Gru. He was just a small, he was small, and we were all kind of small, to say about five, five foot ten, 135 pounds. When he came back, he was six feet, about 190 pounds. He's the only man that, that I know in prison that grew. When he got home, they didn't believe it was him. Well, when he went back home, they. His father had passed away. His mother had already died. And there was nobody there. <coughs> they said, well, you are buried. So he went down and looked, looked at the cemetery. This, right, Still to this day, his, his <coughs> monument is still there. Walter Rush died at such and such a day. His father had collected $10,000 insurance. And they, they had the burial and so forth. Never knew that his son was alive. Another thing that's interesting about Walter was he he, he was his, uh, stationed in Stalag 17 when he wrote the book. The guy that wrote the book was his bunkmate, came from Maine. And Walter, to this day, has one of the four original books. It wasn't Stalag 17, it was called something else. But he has one of the original four books. And uh, a very interesting story about that. Uh, <coughs> A radio operator should have been a, a priest. He's a very, very religious guy. Every time we flew, he, I said my prayers, but this fellow always brought his Bible with him to read the Bible. And to this day, that's what he does. He's a retired uh, executive of a bank, and he is uh, <coughs> he uh, he's very involved with uh, the religious group. My uh, pilot came back. He didn't live very long. He died of cancer. Uh, after about 10 years. Co-pilot stayed in the, in the uh, Air Force, made colonel, and he got killed in a uh, flying the uh, uh, into Berlin when they had the Berlin oh, right. blockade. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was flying in one day and the plane cracked up. The, uh, as I said, the, the navigator, all these other people were uh, they killed during, the, yeah, during right. our uh, yeah. uh, flight out of Right. Sorry to interrupt that story that you were going to tell about not, not traveling back to... Now, traveling back, <coughs> Frank Mastronati was supposed to get his, his, uh, <coughs> his uh, uh, flying cross medal. <coughs> and uh, some people where he's uh, located found out about the story about us saving the uh, life of, uh, of uh, the... Uh, ball turret operator, and they wanted to give him the, the flying cross. They didn't know anything about me, so they said, well, where would you like to have the flying cross presented? So we decided to have it presented at our air base, uh, no, Alcabera Air Base, which is our headquarters for our wing. And we went, uh, the four of us went back, the bombardier, the ball turret operator, and the radio man, we went back, and they, they honored them by giving them the, the uh, at that time. One of these days they're going to do the same thing for me, for mine, but <laughs> it was very interesting. That was about 12, 13 years ago. Then um, I took them, we all went back to France and we went to visit the, uh, the, the nurse that helped my bombardier uh, get back to health. She was going to medical school with a Greek fella they came from Greece, was also going to medical school in, in Paris. And the two of them were students, and they were helping him recover. And uh, <coughs> that woman was related to royalty. And she, if they had a queen of France to this day, she would have been the queen. Mm. Yeah. 
And uh, we went back and visited her and her husband, and she became a, an ophthalmologist and operated on the eyes. The husband was a chief of uh, uh, a kidney specialist in France. They both retired. She just passed away. He's still living. And then we went to visit the, my <coughs> a friend that uh, was the uh, Genevieve and passed away. To but in Paris, I thought I could meet up with my uh, gendarme friend, but he, he and his wife had passed away. We went by the house and tried to meet other people that were around at that time. Because there was over 200 people to help me, but I didn't know all their names, yeah, you know? Yeah, right. And they don't want to give you all their names. Sure. So if, they, if I got captured, then I'd have blown uh, several cells, and we don't want that to happen. Uh, finally, we went to Reims and uh, met we had about 150 people there to help me. And we had a good reunion with all the people. And uh, we, uh, my, uh, what was his name? Uh, George Lee was an uh, executive of uh, uh, the tire company, Michelin Tire Company. His family was always at the wheels and tires and so forth. And he was the chief executive of one of the, one of the divisions. Uh, uh, Rene Felix had passed away, but his wife was still living. Then we went over to to see my friend, uh, the fellow that kept me up for th uh, 30 days, uh, Pierre de Marché and his wife. Uh, they had moved away from uh, uh, the little town they were in, Chambezi, and they went to Reims. From Reims they went to Cologne sur mer that's along the English uh, Channel. Uh, another part of France by uh, where the invasions took place. And he opened up a bakery there and became one of the top bakers and in, in, uh, in, uh, pastry makers in Europe. Top notch. He supplies the Air France and, <laughs> and the railroads. And he, just, he and his wife just passed away and their son took a business over and the son is turning over to his son. When I was staying with him in Chomez, uh, he had no children. And he considered me his son. And um, I have a, on my keychain, I have a medal that was given to him by uh, President de Gaulle. And the last time I saw him, he get presented to me. I said, No, you got to give that to your son. He says, You're my son. I want you to have it. So I get the medal. And uh, then I took my wife another time, went back. With I went back three times. I went with my wife, went with my wife a couple of times, and uh, and uh, the last time we went there, we saw. No, the next to the last time we saw them, and we stayed with them a while. And uh, shortly after that, she passed away. Then we went back again to see him because we knew he wasn't going to live much longer. And uh, we said our goodbyes. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years ago, he passed away. Mm -hmm. But the, I communicate with the uh, people there. I, you get to the point where they write to you and they ask you for some help about this, that, and so forth. Like a niece that might have MS says she needs this type of medication. They don't have it over here. Can you get it for us? So I go to doctors and so forth and try to supply it for them. And then I get the French embassy to try to help them out, turn it over to them, and they take care of it. So a lot of things like that happen, which is good. It's very yeah. gratifying, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've kept a uh, list of names. Of, people that I remember and, and they remember me and get back and forth. I don't know if I can make one more trip. I'll try to make one more trip uh, uh, now that I'm 82. My wife would like to go back one more time. I think I'll do it. Yeah. Well, uh, well, as we wind down this interview, uh, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you'd like to talk about or do you have a, a closing thought or statement you'd like to, to make? Well, the only closing thought uh, I'd like to make is that uh, I want to thank you for taking the time and effort to do this. I know there's a lot of people who have uh, come forth the past uh, uh, four or five years asking for these interviews. And I've given countless of interviews to people and, uh, and uh, it does bog you down somewhat, but uh, when you get somebody like yourself that's taking the time and effort and, and expense to do this, uh, especially in your own hometown, it's gratifying. And I want to thank you very much for doing this and uh, helping out the veterans of the past. Oh, certainly a 
thanks is all mine, by, by all means. Well, thank you. Well, well, thank you for your time today, and uh, thank you very much for your service to our country. Thank you. Yeah. My crew, <coughs> our left waist gunner, Jack Crowley, who died the, on March 20th with a uh, 20 millimeter in the neck. Next to him is a Walt Hood operated, Walt, uh, Walter Rush. I told you all about him. And I'm here, third man in. This is my co pilot. His name is Kroll. And this is my pilot, Jack Dunaway. And this is our 21 year old navigator who passed away. His name was Bill Mock. And next to him is Ben's, Marvin Brenz, the fellow, the tail gunner that I uh, saved his life. And he got killed on March 20th. This gentleman was replaced as the engineer of the plane. And a fellow named Harry Horse took his place. And he's not in that picture. And this is uh, our radio operator. Ralph Mastronati, who should be right now a priest. <laughs> and what was the name of your plane? And that plane there is our training plane in Delhi, Texas. Oh, okay. The, the plane that we were flying the day we got shot down was a man of war. Man of war? But we lost three planes, so we never had a really a plane to fly in that people could call their own. And as a result, the planes were going down so fast and furious that most people that had a plane to fly in, came in after World War, uh, after the invasion, when the German Air Force had uh, dissipated. This is my family days back uh, when I was about uh, seven years old, and that's me right there. And my brother Chuck is here, the one that lives out in Austria right now. My brother Sauter, who was a principal at Hero High School. This is my sister Madeline, who lives in Springfield. My mother and father. My sister Ann that recently passed away, and my brother George that was the mayor of the city of Haverhill. Hmm. Uh, the picture shows, uh, indicates that we're in Alconbury, England, which is our headquarters of the 8th Air Force for our, our wing and uh, back in World War II. That, that base is still in existence. And uh, this is uh, the day that we, uh, we were honored by them with a certificate of appreciation, as you might see here. And uh, this is myself. This is Frank. Uh, this, this is uh, Frank Mastronati, and Marmadia Ted Kroll, and Walter Rush. And that uh, day or two later, we finally got his uh, distinguished flying cross at another reception. What what year was that? That was back in 1987. The top sergeants of Alcumbe uh, honored us by giving us this certificate of appreciation when we went back, back to our headquarters in England. And this uh, was given to me by the Free French. This is the honor the Free French gave me, and uh, the medal uh, that uh, working with the Free French during World War II and helping them out. And I believe they helped me more than I helped them. Yeah. But what they appreciated so much the things that I did for them. What year did they give you this award? You this remember? was given to us in, in 1987. 87 as well. This is a, a De Gaulle medal that was given to uh, my friend that uh, helped me out for 30 days. One of the three people that uh, saved my life uh, with the French underground, Pierre Damaché. And uh, on the back part, you notice that uh, De Gaulle uh, has the inscription of uh, what, what they did. Now, Pierre de Maché gave me this um, like two years before he passed away because uh, he considered that uh, I was his eldest son because when I was with him at the time, World War II, he, was, he had no children. Now he has one son and a grandson. Instead of giving it to his grandson or son, he felt as though that I was his son too and I was his eldest son, and I, I will always cherish it. This is myself flying uh, after we had flown several missions. I think it was my fifth mission. And I, I got hit in the nose with a flak, as you can see of uh, my nose there, and just missed my eyes. And uh, I, I get hit by flak about three or four days before that. And it was recovering pretty good. But they wanted to take my picture with uh, the flying regalia that we wore. You can see my goggles and you can see the 
uh, Mae West and the jackets that we wore because it's 60, 70 below zero, they get the oxygen mask and so forth. And uh, uh, it was taken against one of our airplanes and uh, they took pictures of all uh, my crew that day and we each had one of these. Now you, you kept uh, pointing to the Mae West, that was a nickname I assume? The Mae West is if you uh, bailed out and you ended up in the English Channel and you'd have you'd open up the May West so you could float with it, yeah, it and uh, as that's the nickname was that's right okay. <laughs> yeah right okay. well in the story I gave you uh, I mentioned the fact that I stayed in uh, Paris with uh, a gendarme and his wife and friends and he uh, had a, a uniform an extra uniform and uh, he gave me that uniform to wear so I could go through German patrols. Uh, while we were on his duty of uh, uh, walking up and down the shop, I would say that was his duty, and I would walk alongside of him, and we did this for two days. And uh, this is the disguise I had to get through those patrols. This is a picture of myself when I got back to Haverhill, uh, and uh, it shows the 8th Air Force insignia, my chevrons, the staff charge, it shows a Caterpillar here for bailing out, saving my life, my gunner's wings, a few of the other medals that I received. The one that I really cherish is the British medal they gave me for climbing the Pyrenees Mountains after bailing out and saving my life. And that's called the Flying Boot. And uh, the English have honored us with that. The bottom down. Okay. Well, as you notice here, my family got together and they decided to save some of my paraphernalia, my, my second dog tags that I received uh, when I got back to, to England after the Gestapo took one of mine uh, and also uh, fr uh, one of the uh, French underground people took uh, the other one. This is my staff sergeant uh, insignia and this is my actual uh, uh, <coughs> pair of wings that uh, they were issued to me. The free French honored me with the uh, with what they wore. When the invasion took place, this is what the Free French wore to indicate that they were working with the Free French and they will help the Americans. This is my Purple Heart, the Air Medal, the, the uh, XPOW Medal. This one here is the original uh, flying boot that the British gave me. As you can see, a bigger picture of that is depicted here. And the AFES means the Air Force Escape and Evasion Society, which I am a member, and the British honor us with by giving us all this uh, flying boot. This is the Coastal Forces, uh, who I've met several times, and we uh, he's the one who saved probably uh, 150 lives. He was given the highest English award for saving people. He was the one who was supposed to come pick me up instead of climbing the Pyrenees but he never could make it. And when I met up with him up in Toronto one day, I said, uh, geez, how come you never came to pick me up? And he says, well, George, he said, I couldn't get up the Pyrenees Mountains with my gumbo. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, the brigade, the parachutes brigade in, uh, in uh, France, uh, when they honored me by giving me a, uh, uh, the brigade uh, insignia. And uh, this is my, uh, Squadron, the 612 Squadron, 4th Bomb Group, and this is the insignia we had. And these are the other medals as well. Uh, Eighth Air Force, uh, MIA pins, POW, all the POWs are considered MIAs, and, and eventually became POWs, and many of us escapees. This is the Eighth Air Force uh, Museum that we uh, have dedicated down in Savannah, Georgia. It's a very interesting museum to take. That's where the Air Force, 8th Air Force uh, started. And anybody that goes through Savannah, uh, Route 95, should drop in and take a look at it. It's only a mile or two off the road. It's a very, very interesting uh, museum. There's others that are not in here, like the Distinguished Flying Cross and a few other medals that I have. I don't have them all. Uh, they either have worn out or they they have to be reissued to me. Okay. This was given to Pierre Damaché, who's one of the three fellows to save my life, and his wife, uh, for saving 28 Americans uh, during World War II. And he handed it to me before he passed away. 
So I, I relish that. I save the fog.